or after the recording. Good evening. Welcome to the Board of Directors meeting for Dr. Cog for Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. I am your outgoing chair, my final meeting. So I, I may make some comments as we go along. I may take some, some latitude tonight uh, as, as we just be scared, be very scared. <laughs> Uh, I do call this meeting to order, and with that, uh, if you are able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Uh, just some, some quick housekeeping. A lot of people here tonight. This is awesome. Um, if you have not been to a meeting before, we have cookies and coffee and that in the hallway, also the restrooms in the hallway. Uh, if you park downstairs, be sure to see uh, Melinda to get the little uh, thing to get you out of the garage. Uh, very important. We like her for a lot of reasons, but especially because she has those uh, magic parking tickets or parking uh, vouchers. Uh, we have some new members we want to announce tonight. Uh, Justin Martinez from the city of Thornton was briefly an alternate, and he is very quickly the full member. So, Justin, welcome. Hi. His, his return here is even, even more symbolic in that he used to work for Dr. Cog. So, welcome. Uh, we have new alternates, uh, some of whom are here tonight. Ryan Shuhart from the city of Boulder, Christine Sweetland from the city of Centennial, uh, Kim Wright, city of Inglewood, Roger Lowe, city of Lakewood, Shannon Lukeman Hermosa, I probably said that wrong, city of North Glen, uh, Roberta Ayala from the city of Thornton, Claire Caram I knew I was going to mess that one up, Claire Caramelia. Claire, okay, I apologize, Claire. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I you know. There you go. Uh, Emily Baer from the town of Erie and Lisa Vitry from Golden. So welcome. Glad to have you here. Uh, an additional announcement. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we have a member that's been here for a long time, that this is his last meeting. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. I, I told him this upstairs, but I'll repeat it to everybody, has been just an incredibly valuable member of, of, of this body. Uh, he has never missed a meeting. Perfect attendance. If I, if I had a little gold star or something, I would award that to Nicholas. But Nicholas, we so appreciate your time. And, and while we look forward to, to Adam Paul joining us as, as in your position, we will miss you. Uh, Nicholas continues as the alternate, so we may see Nicholas as well, but thank you for your service. With that, we will go ahead and ha do roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and just so everyone knows, since we do have quite a few new alternates tonight, uh, I will mention the member first, and if they don't respond, then obviously if you've read the alternate, please do respond. All right, here we go. Adams County, Steve Odoricio. Yeah. <clears throat> Arapahoe County, Jeff Baker. Here. Boulder County, Claire Levy. Here. City and County, Broomfield, Austin Ward. Here. Clear Creek County, Randy Wheelock. George Marling, Clear Creek County. Uh, Denver, Nicholas Williams. Here. Uh, Kevin Flynn, Denver. Here. Douglas County, George Teal. Abe Layden, Douglas County. Uh, Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Andy Kerr, Jefferson County. Here. Lisa Ferre, Arvada. Here. Angela Lawson, Aurora. Allison Coombs, Aurora. Present. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Here. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Here. Thank you. Margo Ramson, Bomar. Greg Mills, Brighton. Chris Fielder, Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Jim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Christine Sweetland, Centennial. Here. Todd Williams, Central. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Steve Douglas, Commerce City. Here. Michelle Rogers, Decono. Adam Moorhead, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot how to work this thing. I hope so. Uh, Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Here. Ari Harrison, Erie. Emily Bayer, Erie. Here. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. 
Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Here. Wendy Padilla, Frederick. Here. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Brian Desher, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Lisa Vitry, Golden. Here. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Here. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Jeslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Here. <clears throat> Stephen Barr, Littleton. Kyle Schlachter, Littleton. Kat Bristow, Lock Bowie. Jacqueline White, Lock Bowie. Winshaw, Lone Tree. Here. Joan Peck, Longmont. Aaron Rodriguez, Longmont. Judy Kern, Louisville. Present. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Greg Edding, Lyons. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Here. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Here. Richard Condo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Terrence Kelly, Sheridan. Here. Neil Shaw, Superior. Here. Justin Martinez, Thornton. Here. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Claire Carmelia, Westminster. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. Present. Darius Pakba, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Hello. All right, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Fantastic. Another quick bit of housekeeping. If you could point your name tag so I can see it, that would be helpful. Uh, I will probably still mess up your names if I have in some cases probably all, all year long, but uh, that's helpful to me as we recognize people who uh, would like to speak. So thank you very much for that. Uh, with that, thank you, uh, Melinda Stevens, for you know, doing that roll call is quite a bit of work, and the work Melinda puts in, I, I joke that, that we love her because of these, but I just at this moment want to thank you for all you do for us. Uh, it's been a joy working with you and sitting next to you for the year, so thank Likewise. you. With that, do we have a motion to approve our agenda? Mr. Harmon, thank you. And seconded by uh, uh, Mr. Vidim, uh, Director Vidim. Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? We have an agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, report of the chair, I will turn it over right now for a report of the Performance and Engagement Com Committee. Uh, Commissioner Jeff Baker, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This evening we had a, a performance and engagement committee. Uh, we received an update from uh, Executive Director Rex on our planning for the board retreat. Are you planning to talk more about that, Doug? I wasn't, but... Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's, that concludes my report. Okay, there you go. And a report of the Finance and Budget Committee from the very task-driven... <laughs> <laughs> Director Whitlow. Thank you very much, Chair. We had a numerous amount of uh, action items tonight, and I do want to say thank you to the members for doing their due diligence and their research before coming to all of our meetings this year. This, tonight was my last meeting and chair of the Finance and Budget Committee, and I uh, so appreciate uh, all the members and, of course, the staff who puts this together for us. Uh, our action items tonight were um, resolutions authorizing the, the executive director to negotiate and ex execute a numerous amount of uh, contracts. First one was with Nelson Nygaard to develop a regional active transportation plan in an amount not to exceed $350,000 for the term not to exceed 24 months from the date of concept, contract execution. Next one was with Fair and Peers for the North Federal Michael Transit study in the amount not to exceed $74,525 for the term of 14 months from the date of contract execution. Next is the Regional Transportation District for support of the fan pool services offered by the, offers, excuse me, offered by the Denver Regional Council of Governments Way to Go program in the amount not to exceed $583,000 beginning January 1st of this year and terminating on December 31st of this year. Next is the Enterprise Leasing Company of Denver, LLC, to provide Vanpool services for the Way to Go Vanpool program in the total amount not to exceed $583,000 per year beginning this January 1st and terminating on December 31st of this year with the option to renew two additional one-year terms upon satisfactory performance. And last, the Charitable Rides and Adult Services, LLC, doing business as on-the-go in the amount not to exceed $125,000 for the period beginning March 1st, 2024 and ending February 2025 with the option to renew four and three additional one-year terms upon satisfactory performance. And sir, that is my report for this evening. And again, thank you very much for having me. 
Thank you very much. And I want to thank both Jeff and Colleen for your service this year as chair of, of your respective committees. Excellent job, both of you. So thank you very much. For doing that. And likewise, thank you to everybody that serves on, uh, on those, those committees. They do a lot of work for the organization, and that extra effort is very much appreciated. So thank you. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll save some of my other comments for a little bit later. Um, and I will turn it over to the report of the executive director, Doug Rex, everybody. Doug Rex. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Wow, my word. This is your last You're going out with a bang. There's no doubt about it. Um, well, good evening, everybody. It's great turnout this evening. Thank you all so very much. I think we'll probably add a, another set of tables uh, for the for the next meeting. It's a good problem to have, so I appreciate your attendance this evening and your commitment to this regional collaborative. Um, as as um, Director Baker mentioned, I will just bring up the retreat real quick to you all. So we have a date. Um, it's April 26th and 27th. Uh, so that's a Friday. So basically, it's a Friday evening and um, the majority of the day on Saturday. So Friday evening, we're going to do similar to what we did last year, where we um, we, we had a social event dinner um, the evening of Friday, the April 26th, at a downtown hotel, and we're going through that process right now to select one. And um, and then uh, Saturday, we'll be in this room. Um, and, you know, we tried to, to conclude kind of mid-afternoon, and we, we had a good conversation with Performance and Engagement Committee tonight about possible agenda items. Our hope is to, um, well, we will. Staff will have a draft agenda uh, to Performance and Engagement Committee next month, and once that's approved, um, we'll get that out to you. But we will send out a calendar uh, invite to you all to kind of hold a date here in the next day or so, so you just have it on your calendar. So, anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Um, just a few items I have for your attention this evening. The first is you may have noticed that the consent agenda is a little larger than normal. We had uh, 10 action items, which is a, a terrible amount for us. Um, so we did put some items on the, uh, on the consent agenda, ones that I have either you've seen before that were uh, informational uh, items last month in your packet or ones that are, um, uh, you know, are more formal like ones that, uh, that we've received um, uh, unanimous consent from both the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee. However, um, you know, obviously you're welcome to pull any of those items, as you all know, but um, if you don't pull the, the SEDS document, the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy document, I just wanted to give a shout out to Flo Rotano, Dr. Flo Rotano on her staff, and the tremendous work that she's done on this in a, in a ridiculously short period of time. Um, also, big shout out to the five Dr. Cog board directors that participated on the on the SEDS advisory committee. Um, and I'm going, I'm trying to see if they're all here. I know Director Sherazai did. Had, did um, Director Colleen Whitlow did. Well, who else? Raise your hand. I, I know there's five. Oh, yeah, Director uh, Ward did. Director Teal and uh, Director um, Sangren. Sangren, yeah. I'm not here. Correct. No, thank you, Director Ward, for that. But I seriously, big shout out to you all. We really do appreciate it. So next steps with the SEDS, in case you don't know, is that we'll send that on, assuming you know we get the, pro the appropriate approvals tonight. We'll, we'll forward that on to the Federal um, Economic Development, um, or EDA. What does that stand for? Economic, yeah, Economic Development Administration. We'll forward it on to them for their approval. And just to recall, just to refresh your memories, um, one of the values of this document is that it does open up the opportunity for additional federal funding, federal grants um, to, this, to this region. So we're very appreciative of that. Of course, it, there's always an importance of this regional collaboration and actually putting together the document and, and the strategies that, that, uh, that uh, exude from that document. So thank you very much, Flo, appreciate you. Um, let me see. We do have a guest in the house tonight that I, I wanted to give a, a quick um, shout out to. Uh, he's, uh, he represents one of our great partners, CU Denver um, School of Public Affairs. His name is Dr. Jose Sanchez. He's a new professor over at CU and his research interest is regional planning collaboration. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a warm welcome, sir. I know you're new to the region as well, so we're looking forward to working with you more intently.
Well, speaking of collaboration, um, we, Dr. Cog staff, we've been working pretty closely with kind of a a uh, cohort of associations, whether they be state or regional associations, and I'm talking about CMI, CML, CCI, CCAT, CC4CA, um, and others, uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, on some of the proposed bills, some bills that have dropped and some bills that are proposed. The one with the most heat that we've been having the most conversation about is the trans transit-oriented communities bill, which dropped was introduced yesterday. That is not on your list of bills for this evening, but we will get to that in in, in due time. But I will tell you that we've we've been having some really good conversations. We we met with um, both the Senate the prime the Senate prime sponsors on the TOC bill, and um, had a great conversation with them. Expressed our concerns um, associated with the bill and uh, as we move forward. So I just wanted to share that with you that there is, you know, kind of a regional collaborative of those associations that are meeting um, and having conversations with, uh, with the bills. And, uh, you know, we feel pretty comfortable that we understand in part, in large part, what the position of, of our communities are. We don't, the, the conversation around Senate Bill 213 was not that far away, so we do recall that. Um, last thing I wanted to mention, oh, there, there is two other things I wanted to mention. The first is, um, so you recall that we are in the process of doing our, our regional housing needs assessment right now. We're in the fourth month of that, and we, you'll be getting a briefing here in the next month or so associated with our progress on that. We're currently doing a systems barrier analysis, um, looking at, you know, what are the true barriers to actually getting units built throughout this region. and. Um, so you'll be getting an update on that soon. But what I wanted to share with you is that we were successful in getting a, um, uh, um, uh, let, me, let me just step back a little bit. So the, the, that housing needs assessment is being paid for in part uh, a, a state grant that we received through DOLA. So we, re, we actually um, uh, uh, did an application applying for additional money for the next phase of this, which is our regional housing strategy. And we found out today that we were successful in getting that $200,000. So that's wonderful. So I want to thank, yeah, no doubt. So I want to thank Sheila Lynch and her team in the Regional Planning and Development Department for, for, uh, for developing that strong application. That will help us tremendously. So we're we'll using that grant money as well as money um, that we have in our, uh, through our Metropolitan Planning Organization process to, to fully fund that, uh, that endeavor. And last but not least, I, I want to show my appreciation to, um, to, to Chair Conklin for his year of service. You know, it's interesting. I've been very blessed um, to have some uh, terrific chairs in my time here at Dr. Cog, and not just as executive director, but in my 10-plus 10, 10 years, um, we've been very lucky to have some great chairs, and, and you're certainly one of them, sir. And I want to thank you, thank you for all your effort, your willingness, and your responsiveness, those texts and phone calls that I, that I send to you throughout the year. I mean, there's times I talk more to, more to Steve than I do my own wife. So um, I'm so appreciative and thank you. And I know you're not going far, but, uh, but I just want to give you a I'll still be out. here. I'll I know you will. And it wasn't lost on me that, that, uh, that you said you enjoyed sitting next to Melinda, but not me. I just, <laughs> uh, and with that, that's my report, Mr. Chairman. I just wasn't that put in my remarks yet. So, uh, this morning, or this afternoon, I was actually at the Jeffco Economic Development uh, uh, Commission, uh, and Flo presented on the SEDS. And I just want to thank Flo and echo what uh, Mr. Rex said about uh, uh, just the, the work Flo and the rest of the group put in to that document. It was very well received, and uh, hopefully it will be here tonight as well as we move into the consent agenda after public comment. Uh, we do have a period of time for public comment. Uh, up to 45 minutes is allocated for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have any public comment?
With that, we will move ahead. Uh, next up is the consent agenda. The items on the consent agenda, I'll go through these briefly. And as, as Mr. Rex mentioned, you can certainly move to pull those from the consent agenda. Otherwise, we'll vote on it as a, a group. Summary of the January 17, 2024 meeting, appointments to the performance and engagement and finance and budget committees, proposed 2024 policy statement on federal legislative issues, the comprehensive economic development strategy, Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments, and the 2024 Federal Safety Performance Measure Targets. Is there a request to take any of those off of the consent agenda? Seeing none, do I have a motion on the consent agenda? Motion to approve consent agenda. Thank you very much, and a second. Second. Okay. Thank you very much. Motion by uh, Director Sando and uh, seconded by Mr. Vidim. Thank you very much. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Moving ahead to action items, we will uh, move ahead to discussion of appointments to the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. And Jacob Rigger, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations, will join us to uh, speak about this agenda item. Good evening. Try that again. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, so good news is I don't have a PowerPoint presentation tonight, but I am going to apologize in advance for the number of times that I'm going to have to say the number two and four in this presentation. And I invite someone to keep a running tally of that if you'd like, because it's going to be a lot, and I'm sorry. Dr. Cog has four voting members of the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. We have two other members who sit on this board um, who represent other agencies and entities on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. I want to thank all of our board members for their service on the Front Range Passenger Rail um, District Board. We appointed our four voting members back in 2022. That's not my fault, that's just the year it was. Um, and when we appointed those folks, two of them were for four-year terms and we will address their seats in two years. Two of them were for two-year terms, and those are the folks that we are, uh, those are the seats that we're addressing tonight. When we reappoint those folks, however, we will be, or uh, sorry, when we're appointing these seats tonight, um, they will change to four-year terms, and they will be offset from the other two in two-year offsets. So I'm really sorry about that. But the bottom line is that all of our members will serve four-year terms, but they will be offset from each other by two years, so we'll be doing this every two years. So if I haven't confused you yet, um, sorry. <laughs> um, so for the two seats that we need to fill this evening, um, following the same process that we did in 2022, we did do a competitive solicitation. Uh, we received six applications for the two seats that we have available. I do very much wanna thank everyone who applied. Uh, we very much appreciate it. We worked with the nominating committee um, to kind of vet through those applications. And I also wanna thank the nominating committee uh, for guiding staff kind of through that process and coming up with a recommended slate of the two candidates this evening. Um, that recommended slate, which is in your packet and shown on the screen here, um, reappointing Mayor Joan Peck of Longmont to one of the seats, and then appointing um, Sarah Nermella, um, Mayor Pro Tem of Westminster, to the other seat. Um, so those are the two candidates um, that the nominating committee is recommending to you tonight uh, for these two seats on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. I will end by noting that there is a kind of quirk, thanks to the legislation, Senate Bill 238, again, not my fault. Um, <laughs> according to Senate Bill 238, um, those of you eligible to vote in this vote that we're about to take must be within the geographic footprint of the Front Range Passenger Rail District. And basically what that means is that almost all of you, everyone who's in our MPO, our Metropolitan Area Boundary, except those of you in Clear Creek and Gilpin counties, and then anyone representing areas east of um, Kiowa Creek in Arapahoe and Adams counties. Everyone else are eligible um, to take this vote that we're asking you to take for these two candidates. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Levy. I thank you. I need my assistant here <laughs> to, to turn the microphone on. Um, no, I I'm um, happy to you know let the the uh, nominating committee do their work. Of course, I know they looked at this very carefully, but I would be interested to know who else applied to be on the board. Well, let's see if I can do that from memory. Um, so <laughs> besides these two, the other four, let me see. Um, Tom Hold of Netherland, hopefully I said your name correctly. Um, sorry, I wasn't expecting this question. Um, Austin Ward of Broomfield, thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> 
Steve Odorizio of Adams County, thank you. That's three, and then we withdrew. Back. And then I'm trying to think of the fourth person. Ah, Director Shaw, yes, thank you. Oh, thanks for that. I just wanted, I was just thinking about the geographic representation on the board. I don't know what, maybe the somebody from the nominating committee could just talk about how you um, arrived at, at these people. Just, you know, I do serve on, on the board, as you noted. Um, as an appointment of the governors and um, and and Deborah Mulvey um, serves the southern area and it I really have seen the value of having that representation um, really spread out along the route and um, and also representation by people who um, you know who are in touch with key constituencies for when this district um, goes to the ballot to try to get a tax approved. So I'm just looking at uh, the appointment through that lens. Yeah, and maybe I'll start an answer and then invite the nominating committee to help me. Um, so just as you alluded to, Director uh, Levy, our other two representatives that will address those seats in two years are Deborah Mulvey from Castle Pines and then Chris Nevitt from the City and County of Denver, a former board member. And of course, Mayor Joan Peck of Longmont is a current representative who's being recommended um, to continue. But geographic, geographic equity and geographic distribution was a part of that conversation, and I'll invite the nominating committee to add to that. Uh, we, uh, you're not on the nom you are on the nominating committee. Okay, so Director Flynn. That, that's why I raised my hand. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Director Levy, I think that when we looked at the applicants, uh, we did look at geographic distribution. We also looked at the, uh, the resumes that they brought to the table, and I've known Sarah Normella for several years because she worked at Denver for a while and uh, she just brought a very impressive skill set to the table that we thought would be very useful in the uh, in the, the board's deliberations and it also added an element to the another North Metro element uh, to the mix uh, where I don't have to get into the sad sordid history of the lack of rail delivery in the North Metro area but that would be another voice and I think those were, if any other member of the nominating committee wants to add to that. Director Spear is on the phone, and, and we will oh, have. she is. Or, I would as, as chair of the committee. So, okay. uh, thank Director you. I knew Spear, she wasn't if you'd present. like to comment, and then we'll uh, hear from Director Mulvey. Uh, thank you so much, and apologies to everybody for needing to be uh, remote tonight, um, but I'm sparing you from my cold. Um, we we did consider um, exactly what you mentioned, Dr. Levy or Director Levy. We were looking at the um, geographic distribution, um, and we were thinking about it not just in terms of <clears throat> who the two were that were um, coming in from our recommendation, but all, who who was also there, as um, Jacob mentioned. And then the other thing that we were trying to do was to create a little bit of a balance of people who um, had already been in service um, on this board um, who kind of knew it as well as newer people too. So that that would be the one thing that I would add as well. Hey, thank you very much, Director Moldy. Yeah, I'd like to perhaps provide a little context um, to Claire Levy's, Director Levy's comment. There are 17 voting members on that board. There is one from the South Metro area. It's me. So I have a lot of talking to do, a lot of representing to do. It's something like 600,000 voters in the district. So that's the context in which we look at that distribution. That said, we're an MPO of a particular region and the representation is for that particular region and we have four people. And so I trust the nominating committee to recognize that we have a South Metro rep, we have a, a further North rep, we have a North rep, then we have a Denver rep. There is missing from further South from that, but that's because it's not within our region. So if folks would like to advocate for a spread of representation, if you live in Jeffco, Arapahoe, or Douglas County, you might want to uh, speak to somebody about whether or not there's an opening in the future on that 17-member board. 
Dr. Moley, would you be willing to make a motion? Yeah, I don't have the text, but I'll freehand it. Uh, there it is. I move to approve the Dr. Cog nominating committee's recommended candidates to represent the Dr. Cog on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, okay thank you. We have a second. Uh, Director Ward, I think you wanted to comment. Um, yeah, I, I did. Um, <laughs> thank you, my assistant over here is <laughs> helping out. <laughs> Um, I, I guess one of my questions that I have, and one that Broomfield was having, uh, in particular with Director Nermella, was she represents the city of Westminster on this board, but she has a professional job for the city now of Erie. Still a town? You didn't want to change it? Okay. No, I will continue calling it a town, even though you're now home rule. Um, <laughs> And in some conversations we've had with Erie, there's not been quite the same level of support for the north west alignment through Boulder. I'm not sure if that's the official position of Erie, but we were concerned that there might be a level of conflict of interest and could, um, could that be handled? And I'm upset that neither candidate is actually here tonight to, to answer some of those questions that I in particular have. I also share um, Director Mulvey's concern about representation because Dr. Cog is a very large <laughs> geographic area compared to other parts of what the district looks like. And each geographic part has very different needs and ideologies of what should Front Range Passenger Rail look like. And I was curious about those, the two candidates, what was their uh, view on what should Front Range Passenger Rail look like and how do you uh, incorporate the communities in Adams County and Arapahoe County, for example, that are so far away from the proposed, quote unquote proposed, uh, or essentially what the state legislature said you have to use, which is the existing right of way. And I was just kind of curious what the, that would, be. I don't think I'll get that answer tonight. Sir Power. Um, thank you so much. This is my first meeting. Welcome. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> you're assisting me. Um, <laughs> I can't speak to um, Director Nermella's intentions, of course, um, but I can speak to Erie's uh, intentions around Front Range Passenger Rail. Um, we are extremely supportive of all transit and transportation efforts within the North Corridor um, and absolutely put all of our energy and effort supporting those efforts um, while also raising um, awareness that, that Erie was sort of sliced out of the planning. Um, we just want to make sure that there is intentional planning um, for our eventual 80,000 residents to enter the surrounding communities that um, will, so that they can access the passenger rail. So um, that's kind of my job at these tables is to, we're planning ahead and making sure that we are thoughtful and intentional about that. Um, and then having worked with Director Nermella, brilliant, as you said, and asset and resource. Um, I'll let her speak herself. Thank you. I, I appreciate your concern. And I agree with Com Director Levy. Her title is here. <laughs> Director, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, uh, I agree with Assistant Levy that, um, you know, graphical representation is so important. And I appreciate the thoughtfulness. Uh, Director Odoricio and then Director Scherzi. Nope. The, the mic's got to go red for us to be hearing you. I got it. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. All right. My radio voice. Thank you all for coming this evening. And uh, I, I got to tell you, the um, I got to, I think like the one thing I can tell you about Sarah Namella is she's a professional and she knows how to represent this body as a Dr. Cog. I've seen her in action as both uh, her day job when she is a planner, as well as her 
uh, evening job as a city council member, and I can tell you that she's going to be able to ask the questions that we want asked uh, and someone that I would support absolutely 100% to ask the tough questions, to represent us well, and to make sure that people's interests are, are looked after. And so I think we're going to have a couple good folks on this, and I would recommend that we vote with the recommendation. Thank you. Dr. Scherzi and then Director Dyack. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I would just reinforce that point from Director DiOricio. Uh, well, I, I just pulled up the nominating applications, and uh, Director Normello came to this as a city councilor for the city of Westminster. So to call into question her integrity around like her day job, I think she did mention this, but part of what we were thinking about in the nominating committee, and I will speak for others on this, is that we do want people with that experience and we're also trying to build a bench. So in reflection to the geographics, there was one other candidate that represented a, a Southern district and that is our incoming chair. And so we are trying to build out leadership across the board and that is something else that we were considering. It, it wasn't a, a vast array of people representing the Southern district. So to Director um, Mulvey's point, you know, please encourage people to step up into these spaces. It is a 17 member board. We did have a smaller pool of candidates and we, I think we're really thoughtful about that. And I would just highlight the you know, the sort of experience that Director Normal is going to bring to this um, opportunity. Dr. Dyack, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I was on the nominating committee for the first cycle as well as the, the current cycle. And, um, you know, uh, the, the first go round, it was, it, was, it was very strategic. I mean, we had a quality pool of candidates and there was some strategy involved to, um, to Get representation. I think we had we had different lines that were being proposed at that point in time. Um, so th there was a little bit of strategy to you know have southern representation, central representation, northern representation, considering uh, the, the various different proposed lines. Um, and um, you know as as the board matured and here two years later, uh, it, it's a it, it was a different conversation. And you know I'm I'm in the south. Um, Town of Parker, uh, we had a candidate, uh, Director Shaw, who was who was there. We we could have uh, gone about it through 15 different lenses, but um, you know we we as the nominating committee, um, I will speak for the whole, um, had some discussion, um, and we were looking for for quality people. Um, we could have we could have spent hours talking about the. Uh, the different pros and cons about strategic, um, you know, what would what would happen if we chose this candidate over that candidate? But, um, you know, we are a region. We are um, representative of the Dr. Cog um, organization. Um, even though I am I am from the town of Parker, uh, when I speak with my Dr. Cog hat on, I try to be very thoughtful. Even though I may have a thought that's of differing uh, philosophy or ideology, I have to encapsulate um, those different thoughts and represent that and bring it back to the board um, for consideration. Um, you know, I, ever since I've been here, um, I believe I've served with people um, who are mindful, even though um, our opinions may differ, um, they're doing the best for the organization as a whole. And, um, you know, I have, I have no question um, that the nominating committee um, had very thoughtful consideration and are providing two candidates for, for strong consideration uh, so they can serve us as the Dr. Cog region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Not seeing any other comments. Uh, yes. Dr. Levy. Um, thank you. Just one more last comment. I appreciate everybody's comments and, and, the, and the good discussion we've had. Um, you know, the other factor that I mentioned is the fact that the, the district will be going to the ballot. It's, we don't know when. Um, and it's going to be important to have a lot of political support for that. Um, it's it's going to be a tough sell. It's a very large district. And people, people are always bringing to, you know, even current directors of Front Range Passenger Rail District, when we talk about the benefits of it and whatnot, they think of it as commuter rail, as transit and access, and aren't thinking of it in terms of 
of a backbone of a, of an inner city system in Colorado. And so, um, you know, this the makeup of the board and the ability to bring some political support is very important. Um, so, it, you know, it's just something for us to keep in mind as these seats come up and in the normal cycle. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a motion on the table, unless there was a desire to, to substitute a motion. Uh, Director Spear. Thank you. I think most of what I was going to say has already been said, so I will um, just add one one more thing about um, Director Nermella's experience as a planner. Um, the nominating committee really did think that was added value, um, in particular with regard to her work on uh, station area plans. Um, that was something that that the nominating committee really appreciated there as well. And I just want to um, highlight or emphasize Director Dyack's point that all of us do wear multiple hats. And when we join the board, um, we're really committing to represent the board and go to bat for Dr. Cog priorities. And um, all, everybody who applied for uh, this position, I, I, I believe, has that quality. Thank you. And I want to thank everyone that did apply. Thank you for, for giving that pool for the nominating committee to consider. Uh, any final comments before we move ahead to a vote? Seeing none, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Okay. Nominees are uh, selected. Thank you very much. And thank you for the conversation. Uh, moving ahead to item number 10, discussion of the Denver Regional Council of Government's Priority Climate Action Plan. Robert Spots, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations, the floor is yours. Thanks for being here. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks for having us again. I'm Robert Spots. I manage the Mobility Analytics Program here at Dr. Cog, and more recently been working on this uh, Priority Climate Action Plan. Uh, we, we met with you last month, so part of this will be a bit of a refresh, but we'll get into a little more detail than we did last month. Um, so a reminder that uh, the board uh, last April unanimously decided to accept this $1 million grant to complete these three planning products. So this is our first product, the Priority Climate Action Plan. Geography, a little different than we're used to. We are including Park and Elbert County. We are required to have the specific list of things in this plan. We've gone beyond um, these specific requirements, but here's what we are required to have an inventory, specific greenhouse gas reduction measures, which we will talk about individually today. And we opted to include a workforce planning analysis because we're recognizing how important that is in all of this work and getting this infrastructure installed. Um, so, you know, th this slide I think it really focuses on, we see this as an opportunity to kind of have more MetroVision types of programs here where we can create voluntary regional initiatives here um, that can help support you all's important efforts as well as centrally administer best practices um, and, and focus on strategies and work together and share our collective knowledge. So that's kind of what we're shooting for in this plan. A reminder that our engagement process and the way we structured this plan was with extensive work from all of your staff, um, all collaborating on a monthly basis, some focused even more on a project management team. We held public meetings. We formed an equity subcommittee where we distributed stipends so these folks could uh, participate and really got incredible feedback from them as well as a public engagement website. So in a very short amount of time, a lot of engagement um, and more to come. Uh, so I'm just going to spend a little more time on this slide than we did last month. Um, I, I do think the submissions inventory may look a little different than some of you may be used to, this is um, the, the, um, a, a protocol that's used for local governments. Um, it looks different than the states. The states, you, you'll notice that like power generation is not on this slide, although you know the power plants create emissions. This uh, in type of inventory is really focused on communities, local governments and regional agencies. And the reason is because these are kind of the levers that local agencies can pull. We, we don't have typically the authority to regulate power plants, for example. However, we can um, regulate and, and as well as 
incentivize better practices in buildings and, and in transportation and in the way those things operate and are fueled. So um, because of that, um, you wouldn't see buildings as highly represented in the state's inventory, for example. However, from a local government's perspective, it doesn't matter if it's electricity or gas. It's, it's where the, the end use is of that energy. So buildings become a huge piece of this pie here. And as you'll see trickling through, as Maddie discusses um, our strategies, buildings really became a focus for us. It's a really challenging sector, and it's, we're going to approach it from all angles. So with that, I'm going to have Maddie uh, walk through our specific eight measures that were selected in this plan. Actually, before I do that, I will mention that the plan is very long. It's 100 pages. It's linked in your agenda. It's a little rough around the edges compared to our normal product because of the timeline we were on but we still are very proud of it and there's a lot of really good information in there. So uh, I'll turn it over to Maddie. All right, can you, okay. Hi everyone, super excited to be back here today and speak to you specifically about the PCAP and the eight measures that we have. A few things kind of ground, laying the groundwork um, before I begin. You're gonna see a few things. It might feel duplicative at times. You're gonna see a lot of things surrounding buildings. That was very intentional. We. As Robert mentioned, did extensive stakeholder engagement. We heard from your staff, from our communities, um, and buildings were a top priority. Um, another thing I want to prioritize and, and mention here, the EPA had very strict guidelines. So some of you already know this, but as a friendly reminder, when you built your PCAP, and for similar people, it's 130 or so other applicants we are up against for this. Um, when you build a PCAP, if your state also has a PCAP, those are the two things you are looking at when you, if you choose to submit a grant. So when you're submitting a grant, if anything is forgotten in the PCAP, you are disqualified. So you're gonna see overlap and that was very intentional. Um, we had a lot of really smart people on this. Um, so again, that overlap is intentional. Um, buildings was a priority. And the other thing, and the final thing I wanna mention before we jump in, is we still have the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan, which Robert will talk about at the end here. Um, so let's say if you're not seeing agriculture, we will be modeling and, and tackling that sector for the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. So again, the emphasis here is intentional. It's buildings, you'll see some transportation, workforce, um, which I'm personally passionate about. But again, if you see gaps, we will fill those in the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. All right, so jumping right in, um, and, and something to remember is we were kind of trying to build the potential grant and the PCAP at the same time. So that was also a factor here, but in the PCAP, um, you'll see the first one we have is our supportive measure and that's that building energy improvement and Pfizer program, which sounds very similar to the grant um, because it is very similar to the grant we're submitting and, and spoke to you all about last month. And essentially what that is, is a holistic program that would be run on through a regional level, um, and it would offer a full suite of cost-saving decarb opportunities, so efficiency, um, weatherization, and so forth for the building sector. Next, the one I'm personally the most passionate about is the workforce. This is something that I believe made our application, and pardon, is making our application for the grant and our PCAP extremely strong. This was not required, but something that our stakeholders and Dr. Cog felt very strongly about. Um, and the point of this is there's twofold here. So bringing new workers into these professions and these trades, and also making sure we're not leaving anybody behind. So what I mean by that is making sure that we're upskilling. So for people who are already in these trades, new technology is coming out all the time. It's pretty transformative. So again, bringing in youth potentially, different avenues there, upskilling people who are already in this field, and then also just alerting people that there are a ton of opportunities coming up for this. So again, this is a supportive measure um, and just enabling that training, full support, offering people training facilities and offsetting those lost wages, childcare and so forth. So again, very intentional um, and very holistic there. Um, next we have our, we call this one mush is the, the term, which is a little funny, um, but that's kind of for the public sector. So it's commercial, multifamily, universities, schools, hospital buildings, and so forth. And again, similar theme here that you're gonna keep seeing um, is that electrification and efficiency upgrade. So again, let's say that's changing, changing the heat pumps, changing out the doors, the windows, making sure everything's sealed and things like that um, to have a better air quality in the area. So that was another one we tackled. Next, um, we have a multi-family property owners building decarb. And one thing I wanna pause before I jump into this, and Robert did touch on this, but I wanna to speak to again, and a lot of you already know this, but just in case you don't, the building sector is 
very complicated. There's so, so many stakeholders involved. And, and the reason we are, the grant we spoke to you all about last month, you know, there's landlords, are you a renter, owner, residential, multifamily, the list goes on, public, private sector. Um, so again, that's why these are all being touched on here. So jumping back to this, it's exactly what it sounds like for that multifamily property owners, and it would ex support existing large multifamily property, specifically 50,000 square feet or above. Um, and again, the attention is to just decrease cost and um, pollution in the area through those upgrades. Next, um, specifically for residential, we have um, very similar to what I just spoke about, but for just for residents, um, and that's upgrading and decarbonizing their homes with as little hassle as possible, as little cost as possible. And again, prioritizing those most vulnerable residents. When we say vulnerable, we are defining through the EPA's guidance and requirements, which is tying together the CGES and EJ screen tools. This one um, was also super exciting and we thought was pretty unique from what I've seen at least through other PCAPs. And that would be offering free home weatherization and energy efficiency um, services for specifically those LIDAC populations, again, defined by the EPA through that CGES and EJ screen tool. So sounds exactly like what it, how it reads, um, but the, the caveat here is specifically for those community members. All right, jumping away from buildings, um, we're in the home stretch here. So we have two transportation ones. Buildings was definitely the most, I would say, excitement we felt from people when we were conducting uh, stakeholder engagement, um, but transportation was also up there. So we wanted to make sure we included to build upon the work that Dr. Cog and others in the region are already kind of completing for us. And that would be just to expand the um, regional bus rapid transit system, um, specifically the network by 2030. And again, many of you already know this, but the intention there was just providing reliable, fast, safe public transit for people. And finally, the other transportation one was our active transportation network. We had a lot of um, excitement for this one, understandably so. I know there's a lot of work going on in the region currently, but again, building upon the work that's already being done, um, expanding pedestrian pathways, um, bikeways, and, and so forth. So money for that would um, also be prioritized. And I'll hand it off to Robert to talk about workforce development. Thank you. So, so yeah, Maddie definitely talked about the high-level stuff. If you get into the plan, there's a lot of EP requirements about what we were required to calculate, both in terms of cost and GHG savings. And I'll tell you, the cost numbers are pretty scary because there's a lot of buildings out there. Um, and the GHG savings do build up and they get they get pretty big as you can imagine. So um, there's a lot more detail in the plan if you're interested in browsing through it. Just to talk on workforce development, that is one of our biggest challenges. Um, there's been a lot of studies happening in the state and uh, our region already. Um, we need a really large amount of growth in this region in, in these trades to meet our climate goals. And currently only about 10% of the, the folks working in this industry are kind of taking on these projects for, for heat pumps. Um, so it's, it's a huge challenge, but we can look at it like an opportunity like we typically do. And there's a really good opportunity for growth in good jobs here and um, better air quality for folks, as well as um, cost savings on their energy bills. So the next steps, um, the, the big one we're looking forward to is the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. This has been a sprint, but we're at kind of entering this next phase where we can take a step back and, and finally take a deep breath and look at how what we learned from this first phase of the project, how we can make that next phase better and, and um, you know, make it a comprehensive plan. And so we are still kind of finding our groove here and exploring what does work for um, your communities, your staff, the, the needs that they see that Dr. Cog could play a role at. There's already been some pretty organic regionalism happening before this project came online, but now we kind of have more of a structure um, and some funding, at least for the next couple of years. So we would like to pursue what their needs are and then as well as look for other funding opportunities. This is just one of the funding opportunities in the Inflation Reduction Act and the Infrastructure Bill, IAJA. So there are other opportunities here where we can pool our resources and potentially go after another big fish after we get this first big fish. Uh, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll just give a, a brief uh, update on the implementation grant. It's been another sprint. We, um, I'll, I'll, I have to give credit to, to Denver has chipped in to pay for a grant writer, which is not insignificant. The city of Boulder has chipped in to pay for a, um, our, our consultant Lotus has been hired on as a um, technical consultant for the grant. 
Um, so that's doing all, all the modeling required as well as the technical appendix, not insignificant either. And then the staff of many of your staff um, have really dropped everything to the point where some of them are putting email auto replies like, I'm sorry, I'm working on a grant. I can't help you right now. I'll see you in a month. Uh, so we, like it's been, it, I, I said it today and I really meant it that it's been like <laughs> this opportunity kind of woke a sleeping giant. And there, there's just been such an amazing amount of support in developing this really big thing. I, I told you it was 25 pages, and that sounded like a challenge. Our challenge is getting it down to 25 pages. We want it to be 100 pages um, because there's so much to say about this and so much good work that we'd like to describe. So um, we are full steam ahead on that. We have a workshop tomorrow all day to make some kind of big decisions and, and narrow the focus. But we feel we're doing the best damn job we can, and we feel like we're going to make ourselves really competitive and just fingers crossed that we get funded. Um, and with that, there's a proposed motion to adopt this PCAT, the Priority Climate Action Plan, and submit it to EPA, and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you. Yeah, regarding the uh, workforce development part of the proposal, uh, has there been any, been any conversations or discussions about uh, potential partnerships with trade unions uh, to help, you know, not only ensure that the people who are going through these programs get the adequate training, but also give them a better chance of, you know, higher earnings when they get through the program? Um, yes, absolutely, and that's a really great question. Um, thank you for bringing it up. Um, so yeah, we are actively seeking letters of support from various workforce, um, I guess you would say, employers in the region. Um, and another thing I want to emphasize that I think we touched on last month, but one thing that we are required to, to show for the workforce is that it meets the Good Jobs Initiative requirements. So if you're familiar with those, maybe you are, maybe maybe not. But um, one of that is guaranteeing that it is a high-paying job that is you can basically build a career in. So it's not just I'll make good money for a year. It's long-term stability it is part of the requirements that we're seeking for that. Director Martinez, thank you for the question. Uh, Director Whitlow and then Director Vidim. Thanks for the, the um, presentation. My question is, um, where did, and who set the planning area up? Where did that come from? It's Good. interesting to see the map. And for the folks who just um, came to the first meeting tonight, <laughs> Erie is here. <laughs> so poor Emily. Um, can you just walk us back what, how the planning area was formed and why some of the biggest components and the biggest advocates for climate um, reduction is Boulder County and parts of Weld County. So I just wanted to ask that question. Thank you. Um, sorry, maybe I'll just go back to the map for a second. Um, so the, the EPA required that this planning grant, the $1 million planning grant, covered the metropolitan statistical area. So that's when pink or purple there. Uh, that is de designated by the census, not by Dr. Cog. However, we were allowed to expand that geography to include neighboring areas. And for us, obviously, it makes sense to include the entirety of Dr. Cog. So we elected to expand the area to include the required pink area as well as the expanded in Dr. Cog boundary. Ah, I need an assistant. Just thank you very much, because it's, <laughs> it's, it, when we go through these slides, it. it on these little font of two or three, um, it, it just I just wanted to make sure that we include that are all in our, our in our in our region, but not to color zone is kind of a. Well, thank you. Sorry. Oh, apologies for glossing over it. Director Bidham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, currently. Uh, year over year, the quantity of coal burning, being burned on Earth is increasing. For example, China is creating, uh, building 52 new coal-fired plants per year. Additionally, 2.3 billion people uh, warm their dwelling or cook their food by burning wood or dung. Um, it's extremely unlikely that either of these factors are going to change before 2040. So taking all of that into consideration, do you believe that the, uh, the steps that you've described here this evening are actually going to make any difference in climate change? 
So, yes, I do. I think um, we're, the National Renewable Energy Labs just this week released a report that said that uh, but the vast majority of, of buildings would benefit from heat pumps versus conventional heat sources, as, as including a reduction in energy costs of 30% or so, potentially. I'm, I'm kind of speaking high-level numbers here. It's, it's an extensive report. But at the very least, people should see cost savings in their energy bills as they install these products. In terms of how this will affect global climate change, you know, it's, it's, this is a uh, a really complicated challenge that's going to take a lot of moving pieces to piece together. And so at every level of government, there's going to be required action to address this. And this is just one of those levels of governments and one of those sectors that needs to be addressed. Dr. Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I wanted to say that I, I, I know that the greenhouse gas reduction is primary but the cost, that intrigued me as well. Are there measures, are there metrics in, in the um, grant proposal and the implementation proposal to track cost savings? Yes, the, the, there certainly will be. Um, in fact, all of that is modeled, in, including the, the average cost for an average sized home, average cost for a multifamily building, for example, mobile home the energy savings, the cost savings, the installation costs, all that has to be really specifically modeled out and spelled out in the application. Excellent, because I know Arapahoe County um, several years ago did an energy performance contract that with our 33 buildings, we were able to get around $5 million worth of infrastructure work done um, based on savings uh, from energy, lowering our energy costs. And uh, it was paid back over time, and it was an excellent way to get our, our backbone, our behind-the-walls infrastructure, our boilers and coolers and, and uh, things like that, all brand new. So thank you. Very much. Uh, Director Hume, I, I, I knew I'd do that. <laughs> well, okay. Welcome back. It's good to have you back. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to confirm and clarify that the – intent here with this plan is specifically here in our metro region, our climate non-attainment and kind of impacting that. Um, is that. Is that accurate? Through this whole process, it's been a little um, confusing for everyone, making a distinction between the plan and the grant application. Tonight, we're really talking about the plan. So this is the plan that's linked in your um, board packet, it's a, the 100-page document that really focuses on those eight measures that are up there and the inventory and all those planning requirements by the EPA. Thank you very much. Welcome back. Do we have a comment over here? Uh, only if it goes red. I give up. Oh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> All right, diving uh, into the regional bus rapid transit a little bit, I want to, I, I love that we're focusing on some measures around um, what's really producing a lot of emissions, and so I wondered if there was any funding that could go towards zero emissions buses, or if that is too, too lofty a goal to reach. So, we're limited in the amount of grant applications we can produce. At this point, it's one, and it's this one that focuses on buildings. However, I know that there's extensive planning happening on these BRT corridors, and that's certainly one of the considerations. And there are many, many other grant opportunities for that type of equipment. Thank you, Director. And anybody having trouble with the microphones, as we know, people that have dealt with these for years still have trouble with it. So it is perfectly understandable. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, do we have a motion? Director Ward. Uh, so moved. Yeah, I think I saw a second. Yes, I'll second. Thank you very much. Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? No. Okay. And any abstentions? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you very much.
With that, we will move ahead to election of officers. And uh, I believe first we'll have a uh, uh, report from Director Spear for the nominating committee. Yes, thank you. Um, if at any point you're having trouble hearing me, please let me know. Um, so thank you, Chair sure, Conklin. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Conklin and everyone who served on the executive board and in our other committees this year. The nominating committee met on January 9th to discuss and make recommendations for uh, appointments to the executive board. And then again on January 29th <clears throat> to discuss and make recommendations for appointments to the Performance and Engagement Committee, the Finance and Budget Committee, and the Front Range Passenger Rail Board. This year, the committee, as I some of us noted before, we're really focused on balancing the geographical representation and experience serving on boards and committees with creating leadership opportunities for some of our more junior members for the long-term well-being of the board. Our recommendations reflect our best assessment of how to create that balance. We had an outstanding pool of applicants and an abundance of qualified applicants. So thank you so much to everyone who applied this year. I also just want to take a moment to thank the executive, uh, to ex thank executive director Rex and staff and all the members of the nominating committee for your work to create these recommendations. <clears throat> and the other thing that I want to note, because um, I think our discussion uh, earlier alluded to this point a little bit. While making this year's recommendations, we identified a need to formalize some of the informal procedures that this committee uses to make recommendations for appointments. So for example, I was one of the committee members who wasn't aware that we have a tradition of moving people from treasurer to secretary to vice chair and then to chair for the executive committee. Um, since it wasn't documented and was more in the realm of uh, oral history, um, not all applicants were aware of this tradition either and it created a little bit of confusion. So I think our discussion tonight um, also highlighted that some of the decision criteria that uh, the nominating committee is using may not be as transparent as we would like them to be. So to that end, one of the things we discussed is having the performance and engagement committee continue the discussion of how we make appointments and bring some recommendations forward to help the appointment process to be a little bit more transparent for everyone involved in future years. Um, so hopefully that will address some of the issues that have been highlighted um, tonight and that came up during the process. But uh, we really are so excited about uh, the applicants that we had this year and the slate that we're presenting to you tonight. So um, Chair Conklin, I am sorry to see you still step down as, as the chair and um, the board is going to be in really wonderful hands. So thank you so much for um, giving us the opportunity to work on this and to present these applicants to you this evening. Microphone, see how that works, assistant. <laughs> Oh, Lordy. Uh, and as somebody that works in radio, I have an understanding that microphones need to be on to work, but sometimes I still miss that. Uh, we do have the slate of nominations. Uh, we can accept nominations from the floor. Uh, if we do not have nominations from the floor, we can, we can adopt the slate uh, you know, just by acclamation, uh, but want to provide a brief moment to see if there are any nominations from the floor. Being none, do I have a motion to accept the slate as presented? Director Wheel. We do like the board officers for 2020. Thank you, do we have a second? second. Thank you, sir. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? And any abstentions? Congratulations to our new officers. Fantastic. <laughs> now that group will start work Hmm. <laughs> there you go. I, I'm out. <laughs> no, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, moving ahead, item number 12, discussion to select representatives to serve on the Regional Transportation Committee, the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee, and the E-470 Board of Directors. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, yeah, this item is related to the, the selection of appointments to our regional committees. Um, we did a solicitation and reminders associated to, to uh, get you all to submit your names to the various committees that we, that we are privileged to have representation on. 
And um, I just wanted to walk through those individually. So I will tell you, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just run down through them. So the Regional Transportation Committee, there are three, uh, sorry, two seats that are available. So, so we have two members that we want to choose tonight, plus alternates. Um, so we have, um, what was submitted was um, uh, Director Mills from, from City of Brighton and uh, Director Wheel from City of Cherry Hills Village submitted their names to be those two members on the Regional Transportation Committee. Um, and and uh, uh, Director Mulvey submitted her name to be an alternate on the RTC. So, uh, so we have our full complement uh, on, on that committee. Uh, so I, Mr. Can I, can I, I just you jump in briefly, yeah. just with, with RTC, just to explain the, the chair of Dr. Cog serves as the chair of RTC and the vice chair serves as vice chair. So those two positions are automatically on the RTC, and then we have additional seats to serve with RTD and, and CDOT. And the executive director also has a seat on that. So, um, so yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I guess I'll ask you if you want to take these individually to vote on, um, because coming up, especially this statewide transportation advisory. Let's, let's take them individually. Okay. Uh, do we have any additional nominations to the RTC? Seeing none, do we have a, mo oh, Director Ward. Um, I know in conversations before, um, there was a request for additional alternate. So if you'd like an additional alternate, I'm happy to serve on that since I, one, just forgot to put my name in, and two, <laughs> I already have enough on my plate, so switching to an alternate is probably not a bad idea. Any objection to adding uh, Director Ward as a second alternate? And Mr. Chairman, if there are others that are interested as well, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt, seriously, if we have additional. Hi. I'm happy to be an alternate as well since I've served. So Perfect. If you want to add me to the list too, just in case. Yep. Yeah, we the, the bench uh, needs somebody at, at some point. Um, with that, uh, do we have a motion to accept that slate as amended? Okay, a motion. Do we have a second? A second. Thank you very much. All in, uh, any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Aye. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Microphone? I actually meant to say, I was channeling Larry Vidum. I, in the, does the selection of alternates have a pecking order? In other words, would it be Director Maldi, then Director Ward, and then Director Conklin, or how does that work? It's a great question, I'll be honest. It, it kind of, like, you know, in the old days, right, when we, um, it was basically, you know, if we got a late, a late uh, cancellation, we'd pick the one that was closest to the office, right? It was one of those deals. Um, but I would suggest that, yeah, there really isn't. Um, I, I would say put me last. So happy to do it, but I don't want to, you know, so. And I will also say that, you know, the alternates are welcome to attend all those meetings. And they do, I mean, I know Director Mulvey, she attends a, a good portion of those. So. Good. Uh, moving ahead to the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. So we had two names submitted for the Statewide Transportation Advisory Committee, or more commonly known as SAC. Um, Director Odoricio and Director Mills, uh, Odoricio, of course, from Adams County, and uh, and Mayor Mills from uh, City of Brighton. Um, so, so this, in in this case, so we have we have two names submitted. We need one to serve as the member and one to serve as the alternate. So this is the place where we actually have to do a, a ballot for the results. So the the highest vote getter will be the member, and the the I guess. The other person will be the uh, the alternate. I will tell you that the stack obviously is a very important committee for us, um, and it's and it's also very nice. They've, they're very flexible about allowing the the member and alternate to sit at the table and converse in the conversation. Obviously, we only have one vote in that, but um, but we have two obviously very good candidates. So um, I'm going to ask Melinda. She's going to go around and and um, and uh, hand out uh, just ballot cards. And if you wouldn't mind making your selection, and then um, we'll collect those. Oh, Linda rightfully just, just mentioned to me to, re, to remind non-voting members you, you can't participate in this selection. Um, so, we'll, so we'll give you time to do that. So the two candidates, again, are, are uh, um, uh, Director Odoricio and Director Mills. 
And while you all are doing that, Mr. Chairman, you're okay if I move Please. forward? Um, so the the um, the next committee is the as E470 Board of Directors. Um, we had one name submitted, uh, and it's uh, Director Mulvey. She is an incumbent on the E470 Board, representing Dr. Cog. So it, it is my recommendation to um, you know I think she's done a wonderful job and, and to move forward with that. We we do need an alternate for the E470 Board if you're so inclined. I will tell you that in the past when we haven't had an alternate. Uh, Director Dyack has stepped up as the alternate. He chairs the E-470 board, so it's uh, it's easy. Um, also, just so you all know, not, 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 not that it's easy being the chair of E-470. It's, it's easy for you to report out. If easy Director being Moses John Dyack. I think, no, it, uh, I think Doug was trying to say John makes it look easy. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so if there's anybody that's interested in serving as the alternate on E-470, I'm sure we welcome that. No, I think you have to be a member, yeah. Thank you, though. But thank you. Sure. Dr. Martinez. Are we voting for all the positions on these ballot cards, or are we going to get separate ones? Is this, what, this ballot card, you're simply voting for the uh, stack, so it's Steve Odorizio okay. or Greg Mills. Thank you. Thank you for yeah. the, the request for clarification. Uh, did we have anybody that wanted to volunteer as an alternate for E470? We can obviously appoint that at a later date. No, we well. can. Yeah. So, so, um, so okay. by acclamation, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The opposed and any or any abstention rather. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Oh, please. You, you pick so up. if you're finished with your ballots, if you wouldn't mind just bringing those forward so that and then Melinda can collect those. For for those new to our meetings, we don't do this every time. Yeah, thank just, just thank so God. Just, just uh, be happy about that. Uh, yeah, it is. It's it's just it's painful. <laughs> yeah. And we will not have a teller committee or any of that stuff. So uh, I'm going to insert a couple of brief comments before we move into our next item, which is, is going to be uh, beefy. Okay, go ahead. I, I was just going to say um, real quick, um, the last one is on the Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, which is an internal committee for us. Um, the, the bylaws for the ACA requires the, the, the board chair to make those appointments, and, and, and Chairman Conklin has already made those appointments of the new members. So the two new members are uh, Paul Hazeman of Golden and Judy Kern from, uh, from Louisville. So appreciate your willingness to speak. Thank you. Uh, Great. Thank uh, you very director, much. Director, uh, you're not Director Rex, Rex. <laughs> Doug, Doug. Um, I, I would like to add my name in the hat for aging. If it's too late, that's fine. But I wanted to see if the board would be willing. You are hereby appointed. Yeah. <laughs> One of my last official acts. <laughs> Good stuff. That, that, that is such an important uh, committee. So thank you very much. And, and I'm, I'm going to be continuing on that. And, and uh, I think uh, Director Shaw is going to be continuing, and, and it, it just, it's just it's great. Uh, as I said, I, I just want to insert a couple of comments, and, and this is after we had the, the wonderful presentation from Robert. Okay. Who I, Director Levy. No, after. It. Okay. Uh, and I, I wish that uh, Robert hadn't left yet, but uh, I, I just, in general, want to acknowledge and thank Dr. Cog's staff. The reports that we get, the, the work that they do, the the absolutely amazing work that we see here month in and month out is, is I find, just inspiring. Uh, it's a, a staff of people that believe greatly in what they do. They do it well. They uh, are responsive. And I just very much want to thank the staff. And this, the, 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 the report we saw uh, moments ago on the, the Party Climate Action Plan is just an example. And, and I'm, I'm thanking staff in general, but, but that is an example of just the work that's put into some of these things. I just really want to thank staff. Uh, with that, I also really want to thank our legislative team, who we're about to hear from. Uh, Rich Morrow and, and uh, our contract lobbyists are, are just absolutely fantastic. 
Uh, we are so appreciative and thankful to have all of you lobbying and working at the Capitol. I don't know why anyone would want to do that to themselves, <laughs> but uh, but we are, are we are very appreciative. And with that, we will move ahead to the next agenda item, which is a discussion. Oh, Director Levy. Uh, no, thank you. I did want to just. Um, make a suggestion or ask a question before we did move on. And sure. I don't know if this is for the chair or director Rex or the body as a whole, but um, I, I, I enjoyed serving on the regional transportation committee and I served when we were all virtual of necessity. And then when we went, became in person, I was unable to make those meetings. And I just wonder if, if um, who, who I should ask to give consideration to having these meetings uh, return to virtual so that there is more opportunity for people to participate. I, I will share with you that RTC yesterday had one of the highest participation rates I think we've seen. Uh, so the body itself has not asked for that, uh, RTC. Uh, I mean, that can certainly be taken as advisement, uh, but you know, I, I think that, that in general, uh, RTC has functioned as live coming back and, and, and effectively. Um, I think you know, I, I would refer to, to Mr. Rex how he would see that advancing if that were to be considered. No, I, I, I think that's right. And we've had conversations with the RTC, come, especially coming out of COVID, right, where we were meeting virtually, as you, as you suggest. Um, I, think they, I think they do find some value in meeting in person because it's really the only time that, you know, we get a group of our board members, a group of board members from RTD, as well as transportation commissioners together in a room, right, to have that conversation. And I know, Director, you know, like like many of us do, I mean, it's those conversations before and after the meeting that are most probably as important as the meeting sometimes, right? So it, so that's kind of nice to be able to establish those relationships. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying with regards, because it is, it's 8.30 on a Tuesday morning, right? And it's not easy sometimes to get downtown. And um, so, you know, listen, I think we're always open to have a discussion about, you know, looking at the structure of that committee, whether, I mean, I know we suggested at one time, maybe we do it over like lunch, maybe so and make it easier for folks to get downtown and, and, um, you know, provide that social interaction. So, yeah, I, listen, I, again, as the chair said, I think we take it under advisement and, and have a conversation for sure. Thank you very much. With that, we will go ahead with the discussion of state legislative issues, uh, and I'll introduce Rich Morrow. Sir, thank you for being here, and thank you for doing what you do. <laughs> it's still only February. It's early, yeah. Thank you. Working. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So we are going to be at... A I have Melinda left, so okay. I got that's okay. Um, I think we start with the item that is agenda item 13A, and that's the previous bills. We had two previous bills that we took positions on last month: Senate Bill 40 and House Bill 1052. Both of those bills passed out of committee and are in uh, their uh, respective appropriations committees waiting for action later in the session. Um, the only thing I would mention, I don't know if this was the right time to mention it, but in connection with Senate Bill 40, uh, I think you all know by now we've also had a related uh, budget request before the Joint Budget Committee to uh, increase uh, the base funding for the area agencies on aging by $5 million. Senate Bill 40 also has $5 million appropriations clause in it. But what we really need is for the Joint Budget Committee to put the $5 million in the, in the long bill before it gets introduced, um, because then we've got the money, we can strike the appropriations clause out of Senate Bill 40. If that doesn't happen, then what will be left is that Senate Bill 40 will have to compete with all of the other bills that are sitting in Appropriations Committee for whatever, I call them crumbs, that the Joint Budget Committee will make available. The latest number I've heard is that each chamber, House and Senate, will have 
15 million dollars to spend on all the bills in the, their respective appropriations committees. That could change up or down. I've seen years where it's been as high as 40 million. But our request for 5 million is highly unlikely, if not impossible, to get, even if it was the 40 amount. So we would be lucky to get a fraction of that ask if we don't get it in the long bill. We had an opportunity, we thought, with all the uh, efforts that all of you and others around the state have put into communicating with the Joint Budget Committee and other legislators the importance of this, we thought we had a, an opportunity last Thursday, I think it was, uh, when they did what they call figure setting on that part of the budget for the, that included the state funding for senior services line item. They could have made a motion to add the money to that line item at that time. They did not do that. They didn't even discuss it. So they haven't precluded any action, uh, but it didn't even come up. Um, there's still time. The long bill won't close until probably within a few days to a week after uh, March 20th revenue forecast, so probably by the end of March. Um, so we have, still have time. They could still make a motion at any time to add the money. So we, so. I'm saying we need to keep the pressure on and keep communicating directly with Joint Budget Committee members. If you have relationships with any of them and you go to coffee or dinner or whatever, <laughs> um, make sure that they understand. And we've had, uh, Ed and Jen and I have had direct meetings with them and they've generally been positive, but we also understand that they're uh, facing a lot of requests and a lot of different uh, pressures in the budget. As happens every year, as Claire and others know, <laughs> Director Relevy know, uh, and I'll ask Ed and Jen if they want to add anything. But um, I think this is what it's down to now. We're still asking everybody to keep the pressure on. Um, and with, you know, we'll, we'll just, it's, it's the old it ain't over till it's over kind of thing. So Ed or Jen, do you have anything you want to add on that? Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Rich. I'd agree. Keep the polite pressure on the JBC. And it's not a question of them not wanting to provide more money. It's just a really tough budget year. But we'll do what we can. Okay. So with that, if there's any other questions or comments, I'll move on to the new bills. We've got a few of them for you today that might have some conversations. Really briefly to chime in, uh, we have 37 members present. Uh, if everyone was able to vote, we would need 25 votes on any to, to take a position. Uh, but we will, before we do any voting, we will ask for abstentions. Uh, it may be that your municipality doesn't allow you to vote or you know, for, whatever, for whatever reason you are abstaining. Uh, that will change that math. So the, the question about abstentions coming first helps us with, with the math as we move along. All right. And then did you have um, the explanation about um, possibility of doing these new bills uh, as a consent if the board is... Correct. I did not mention that. Uh, Mr. Rex and I spoke about that, that, that on the new bills, uh, if we are comfortable with the, the recommended stand, uh, we could possibly approve those as a group and move faster to those that we're being asked for our opinion on. Uh, so tonight there are some things that you want to get. Yeah, I think we've thinking. got uh, several of the very first bills are all have staff recommendations. The last four bills are listed as board direction requested. Now, obviously, if anybody wants, we can vote on those individually, but the, Absolutely. the plan is that we try to package those out of efficiency. Yeah. We'll deal with that as we get closer to that time. Well, I'll just scroll, too, as you look. Is 1211? Uh, real quick, oh, sure. we'll take Director Flynn, and then we'll turn oh, yeah. it back over to you. Sorry, Director. Thank you. I have no objection to uh, going on consent as long as you count uh, the two Denver votes abstaining uh, because our Joint Administration yeah. Council team has not well, and again, we'll get to abstentions okay. as we get closer to that moment. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so uh, just to, so everybody's clear that Senate Bill tw or House Bill 1211 we have for support, uh, Senate Bill 32 for support, Senate Bill 36 
for amend Senate Bill 65 for support. And so those would be the ones that are on the consent. I would suggest that what I just said, I, I, th I think my understanding was if it's a recommendation of support, we could do those as a group. We may want to hear more about the amend. Sure. But we'll, I saw a hand over there. Dr. Levy? Yeah, that was my hand. But if we're, if we're going to do the amend separately from the support. Yeah, we yeah, can pull that off. Awesome. Thank you. So, with can can you one more time run through the yes. what what you are saying, and if you would read the title as you say support just so everybody you bet gets you bet. That. So, um, House Bill 1211, state funding for senior services contingency fund, and we had a good conversation about that uh, last month. The bill actually has now passed throughout the legislature, I think unanimously, I don't think there was a single no vote, and it's now on its way to the governor. So we, we should still go on record. Um, Senate Bill 32 is the title, uh, short titled Methods to Increase Use of Transit. Um, we'll skip Senate Bill 36 for now, and Senate Bill 65 is the Mobile Electronic Devices and Motor Vehicle driving bill so those would be okay. is it, that's three of them that's that's three that the staff yes. recommends support uh anybody that wants to specifically pull one of those off a consent agenda regardless of how you're voting regardless if you're abstaining are there any of those three that you want to have a more robust conversation on okay seeing none who would have to uh abstain on that vote if we could get a count of who would need to abstain. Director Flynn. We're gonna complicate this a little bit. We just got a text from uh, the administration that they have joined us on a support for 32. But you so couldn't vote out. on the others. But we have to abstain from the others. <laughs> okay, so Welcome because of that, we're gonna set, uh, Director Kerr. Microphone. Co. There you go. Jeff Co. Uh, we'll have to abstain on 65. Okay. I think we have just resolved the fact we're going to need to vote on all three of these individually. <laughs> okay. Hey, at least at least we know. At least we know. <laughs> so, um, is anybody having to abstain on 1211, the state funding for senior services? Uh, anybody want to make comments on that before we vote on that one? Okay. All in favor of us following the staff recommendation of support and not needing to abstain, raise your hand, please. And keep the hand up while we get the, the accurate count. Okay, thank you very much. That motion passes. Thank you. Uh, Senate Bill 32, methods to increase use of transit. Who will need to abstain? Okay. Fire for yep, five. Thank you. Five abstentions. Okay. Uh, any need to comment on that? Are we okay going ahead with a vote? All in favor signify, let's raise your hand. Yeah, I can't do a voice vote on this. Okay, any opposed to supporting? Okay. And any abstentions? Still important to get the votes, so thank you. Okay, uh, that passes. Uh, Senate Bill 65, uh, mobile devices, who would need to abstain on that? Seven will need to abstain. Any, uh, is that an eighth 
Okay, eight would need to abstain. Okay. Uh, any discussion on that? Okay. Okay. Yes. Please. Director Barra. Um, so to support um, no amendments. The staff recommendation is support, which would be without amendments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all in favor of uh, going with the staff recommendation of a support position on this, raise your hand and keep it up. I've been too busy. Uh, any opposed? <laughs> and any abstentions? Thank you very much. And I guess I asked for abstentions twice. I apologize. Not trying to confuse matters. Yeah. Thank you all for maneuvering through that. We will now go to uh, the item where the staff recommendation is amend so we can get a, a fuller uh, answer okay. on that bill. So that is Senate Bill 36. And I would love to turn that over to my subject matter experts behind our lobbyists <laughs> to talk about why would we have an amend on there? Really? Okay. Evening, this is Han. Good evening, board. Ron Papsdorf, Transportation Planning and Operations Director here at Dr. Cog. Um, the concept here of increasing funding for safety improvement projects, particularly those aimed at our most vulnerable users of the transportation system, namely pedestrians, bicyclists, those in other um, motorized vehicles that aren't protected by a shell of a vehicle is an important policy. It's a policy that actually this board has endorsed through our taking action on Vision Zero plan that was adopted back in 2020 and is currently being updated now and will come forward to the board. So. Um, that has been an important policy position of the board. I think our, our review of this proposed bill, the way it was introduced, I think what we're focusing on in terms of potential amendments is trying to streamline um, the, the process of getting the funding out the door to local governments to actually make those improvements rather than through a competitive grant process administered by an enterprise housed at CDOT. Um, get that money out the the fee sorry to back up and give a little bit more context on the bill if you haven't read the summary the bill imposes an additional vehicle registration fee on light duty trucks and passenger vehicles it's a graduated fee that increases as the weight of the vehicle increases to raise revenue the estimated revenue is about 20 million dollars a year um, our feeling is that, and it's only opposed in the 12 most populous counties in the state, um, eight of those in the Dr. Cog region. So all of the Dr. Cog region, except for Clear Creek County and Gilpin counties would be assessed this fee for vehicle registrations. We think that an amendment would be appropriate to the bill to just allocate that money out to local governments by formula uh, through the enterprise, because they're the ones that can assess the fee to get the money into your hands, your community's hands, to focus on the specific project safety improvement projects to address those vulnerable user needs. We believe that you know what those needs are in your communities and you shouldn't have to go and compete um, against other counties um, and have grants awarded by a five member um, enterprise board. So that's, that's, the, that's the gist of, kind of how we'd like to approach and pursue amendments to the bill. Dr. Levy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, question, Ron. Um, our staff um, believes that the uh, enterprise law may not allow that formula funding. So they have two concerns. One is that, and I don't have the background on it, I didn't look at the law myself, but that that may not be allowed. Um, maybe it's inconsistent with enterprise status that the legislature would direct how the funds are distributed. So that was one concern. And the other is that uh, the, the uh, amendment um, to have the Transportation Commission serve as the board also may not be uh, consistent with enterprise status because it's supposed to be an independent governmental entity. And those were just two issues our staff raised and suggested that we just support. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Director Levy, um, I, I, 
I would have to dig further into the first into the first question. Um, I think enterprises have pretty lot of broad latitude in how they allocate funds that flow through the enterprise. On the second piece, the Transportation Commission is already the board for the bridge and tunnel enterprise. So I think at least based on that, um, there wouldn't be anything that would preclude the commission from operating as the board for, for this enterprise. If, if I could just clarify what you said on the first point, I, I thought maybe the concern was that as an enterprise, the board should have that discretion, and if it's put in statute that it has to be formula-driven, perhaps that's in, uh, inconsistent with that, that um, enterprise status. I mean, I understand, and I, I like the suggestion of having it formula-driven. We shouldn't be competing with one another for these things. It should go from the area in which it came, which is what a fee should do, so I get it. But that, yeah, that was the concern raised. Yeah, um, if I may continue, um, Director, you, <coughs> thank you. That, that's an interesting point. I think it's worth that further conversation if the board elects to take an amend position. We can pursue, pursue some of those details as part of that conversation and ferret that information out. Um, and it could be as simple as the board of the enterprise determines a formula by which to distribute the funding, right? And there's already language in the bill as introduced that directs the enterprise to seek to allocate the funds through the discretionary grants proportional to where the revenue is raised. So I think there's at, at least the, the legislative sponsors believe there's some ability for the enterprise to make some decisions about allocating on some proportional basis, and maybe there's a different formula to use. That might be the right. Director Cockrell, and then Director Kerr. Thank you. Um, I wanted clarification. It sounds like the fee would be applied in tiered amounts calculated on the motor vehicle's weight for um, privately owned vehicles. Um, I guess what comes to mind is that uh, are we breaking this down to the level of a sedan versus an EV? And EVs are naturally heavier, but typically have more safety features that would prevent these sort of accidents. And would there be any kind of consideration about newer vehicles typically have pedestrian monitors and that sort of thing? So an older sedan and a heavier EV sedan really aren't comparable threats to these vulnerable populations. Mr. Chair, Director, um, that's a that's a detail that I don't believe is addressed in the bill. The fees the fees are applied based on vehicle weight, so they start at zero for passenger vehicles that weigh less than 3,500 pounds, and it goes up to a maximum of 29, a little over $29 for passenger vehicles that weigh um, more than or equal to 9,500 pounds. And then there's a different scale, and then there's there's iterate there's kind of increments between that, but it is it is based solely on the vehicle's weight. Director Kerr. <laughs> Thank you. The, um, I'll, I'll tell you, I uh, appreciate the idea of uh, how you're saying the allocation going out not being the grants, but uh, just by formula. Uh, is Jeffco not being debruced at this point, um, unless uh, as the money is coming through an enterprise, that that Bruce's state money. Otherwise, if it's state money, it counts against our, our revenues. And we would probably, at least in the short term, not apply for the grants because of that, or, or depending on, on the amounts. Um, smaller amounts we might, but larger amounts we might not want to. So um, right now, at this point, um, I don't think Jeffco would want to go with that. Uh, Mr. Chair, Director Kerr, the our proposed amendment wouldn't eliminate using an enterprise to raise the money and funnel the money out. So it would still be kind of enterprise funds. Is that? Oh, Lee, is, oh, sorry, Director Kerr. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to our TABOR limit, not sure. the, the enterprise, of course, is not subject to TABOR, but 
Jefferson County is. So, um, and I, I think there's some question and I know. No, I, uh, well, I just think uh, maybe, I mean, you would have the ability to reject the funds um, most likely. I mean, nobody's okay. gonna force you to take money. But oh, <laughs> I think, but it could that could be put in explicitly for I uh, imagine other counties are in the same position you're in, but maybe the ability to reject the funds. Director Shaw. Um, just to comment, you know, and I think you know we're generally in support of this. I think our challenge was the, the bill purports to talk about mass versus acceleration. But then the fee structure is different if it's a light truck versus a vehicle. So my Tesla, which weighs the same as an F-150, pays a lower rate, even though the impact on whatever it hits is the exact same. Um, so to Director Cockrell's concern, you know, if you treat all vehicles the same, independent of the type of vehicle, just on mass, we're in support. But our challenge here is definitely penalizes light trucks. Okay, so I don't have a feel for where we stand on this because there have been some great questions. Uh, is there more conversation before I ask for a motion? Now, that motion could be whatever you want it to be. Do we have a motion? Mr. Dr. Chair. Shaw. I move that we monitor this bill uh, allowing our legislative team to make what changes they can based on their what they've heard and get back with us. Do we have a second? Uh, Director Mahal, uh, thank you. Uh, any conversation on the motion before we vote? Let's Recommendation of a position on monitor. Director Levy. Yeah, could, could we get an explanation of how monitor to work on amendments differs from the recommendation of amend. We would we would simply be looking for um, willingness and answers to the question so they could come back with us, back to us and then ask to take a position. So we would have no position if we're monitoring, but it doesn't preclude them from having a dialogue with the bill people. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm not sure legislatively how that translates. Um, Director Wynn, if, if I, could I make Director a Levy. substitute motion in the friendliest possible tone? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do move a substitute motion that we remain in an amend position and that our staff take these concerns back to the bill sponsor. I And I make that motion because I, I do think in general, this this body does support the, the bill. We took that position previously. It needs a little bit of work, which we've heard. So I think that puts us in a stronger position. I would second that. <laughs> so you've kind of withdrawn your motion. I, did, I have a question. It's a substitute, so right. we vote on that, and then the motion we okay. should vote on is Director okay. Levy's. Okay. Thank you. I, I saw a hand uh... on. All right. Um, don't we have to have a specific amendment to take the position of amend? amend? Meaning, if we have a specific thing that we want to change, then we would have a stance of amend. But since we don't have a specific thing that we need to change, then we would stay at monitor. And then they would come back with feedback and we would say, okay, this, this, and this are points of amendment. Mr. Morrow, what is your preference on this? I what, guess my thought- Help guide us through this. Yes, Director. I, my, my thought as, as you were saying that is, it depends on, on, on how specific you think the amendment has to get. I mean, I, I think Ron has explained the amendments, like at least the concepts uh, that we would like. We don't have it drafted as, you know, line, you know, page two, line three, strike this and add that, which we, we can do that. But, but I would suggest that, that you can decide if you feel comfortable with Ron's explanation and with the board discussion that you have a good enough sense of what amendment we'd like to see in the bill that we can still approach be in an amend position and approach the sponsors and we can get back to you with uh, a specific language and present it 
again next month. So it's still, and maybe because I've heard this mentioned in other forums too, it's like staff has direction to seek amendments. Dr. Wheel. Or discretion. Thank you, Chair. I'm curious about the time frame. Things can move very fast. Is this a month from now, will there still be something to talk about? And, and that's that's a good point, I think, for trying to, to manage those kinds of questions. If, if we waited in t another month to take any action at all, it could already be halfway through the, the process or more than that. A word from uh, Mr. Rex on how it may not be a month. <laughs> no, thank you for the question. So we had a conversation at the executive committee today that, um, so our board work session on March 6th, I believe, I think we're planning on treating that as a special board meeting so that it'll provide the opportunity for, for the board to take action on, on bills that have dropped since, like in the last 24 hours, most notably the TOC bill. Um, and we can take this bill back up again at that time as well. So I, I don't think there's going to be any bill that's going to move quick enough that we wouldn't be able to, in two weeks, be able to make that change. So we had a motion to monitor. We have a substitute motion, which we need to, to vote on first, uh, that would, would adopt the staff recommendation of amend. Uh, with staff feeling comfortable that they have enough to be going on is what I heard in the answer to, to your question. Uh, so any further discussion be we, before we vote on the substitute motion? Okay. Who needs to abstain from voting on that? Okay. With that, who is in favor of the substitute motion to go with the staff recommendation of amend? And any opposed? And we've already asked for the extension, so there you go. So we maneuvered through that. Now, do, do we need to act on your motion at all at this point? Because that one passed. So, okay, good. Just, my council just doesn't deal with a lot of substitute motions. So, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we shall move ahead. Okay. Thank you, uh, Director. Um, so, the next four bills are all uh, listed as board discretion or board direction requested, uh, you know, mainly because the, the, the staff didn't feel comfortable making a recommended uh, position on these bills. Uh, the first one is the accessory dwelling units, so that's one of the major topics that we've all heard about uh, as part of the whole land use affordable housing discussion. I'm sure you've all been in many meetings and maybe have formed your own opinions about that. Um, this is the, the, the main bill. There is another n newer one out there that didn't come out in time to get on, on, on this month's agenda. We can always bring it next month. It's Senate Bill 154. Uh, but this one, um, I think what I will do is just ask the board if anybody has comments or questions, uh, opinions about the bill, and we can go there. And we'll get to that in one second. Could you please clarify as much as you know what 154 says? I, my understanding of the of the bill that the new bill that's not here is that it attempts to take the idea or the uh, statewide 1152 focuses on the urban areas and 154 uh, extends it and, and it may not be I haven't read the details of it to see that it's exactly the same but it it, it addresses the issue more on a statewide basis. Dr. Flynn. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I would propose that we take a position of amend uh, and maybe even heavily amend. I won't get into all of the concerns I have with this bill, but the primary one is that it basically eviscerates all the work that Denver has already done. So my proposal uh, to amend would be that the bill be amended to recognize, to allow uh, those municipalities, I suppose Denver might not be the only one, that already has adopted a, uh, a set of uh, design standards, forms, setbacks in all zoning contexts from urban 
to urban edge to suburban. Uh, I represent a district that has only one alley in the entire among the entire 65,000 population, one alley. And so we adopted, after a two-year public engagement process, we adopted very uh, we adopted forms and standards that will allow for construction of ADUs in every single unit zone district, every one. And we are in the process now of drafting a citywide blanket rezoning for all single unit uh, zone districts to enable that. It seems like a lot of ado over something that has very little potential to help the affordability problem, frankly, because uh, every parcel where we've added a detached ADU that sold in the previous two years sold for a median price of $900,000. So it, it, it's uh, the potential, it, there, there could be very few of them built as a result of this, but we still have to protect the process that Denver and perhaps other cities have gone through to engage the public. I have two neighborhood planning initiatives gonna happen in my district uh, in the next year, involving seven of my statistical neighborhoods all collectively. And I can't go to my constituents, if this were to pass unamended, I can't go to them and tell them that their input matters if the state can come in and say, no, we know better. Uh, uh, you know, if, if the folks up the state legislature want to do land use, they should have run for city council. Well spoken. Director Lance, then Director okay. Shaw, then Director Sturker. I would uh, second what uh, Director Flynn just talked about. What they're really talking about is home rule. And what they want to do is take control of everything we do. This is just a first step among the, the five different bills or, or more that they brought out to take control of what Denver's doing, what all of us are doing. And, uh, we shouldn't support any of them. We ought to be against every one of them as a body. And that's the only chance that we have to maintain any control at all. Director Shaw, uh, Director Starker and then Director Mulvey. Thank you. Uh, in that in that same vein, I would say we should um, not support this bill and and more than amend. I mean, the amendment itself, you'd have to take away all the preemptions, at least in my mind. So I would oppose. So the question is, would would the maker of the motion? <laughs> um, I don't know. Was it a motion? Yeah, no motion it wasn't yet. a motion. Uh, no, then, so there's no motion suggestion. The odd thing is here, I have to abstain anyway because we didn't take a position. <laughs> <laughs> Let you get your say, Director Starker. I would uh, I would ask for a friendly amendment that we oppose unless amended to uh, remove all the local preemption language in the bill. And again, there is no motion on the floor, so. Then I, then I would make that motion that we, a motion to oppose unless amended to move uh, local preemption. We have a second to that motion. Second. Okay. second. Okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, with that, we will go to Director Mulvey. I'll throw a wrench into it, and I apologize for this because I, I share the concern about local control, but I also add what I spoke about last year, and that is the property rights that would be changed and altered that would cause a ton of lawsuits and the law is not written to transfer the cost of those lawsuits away from the municipality, which means this is a property rights issue that could get somebody sued at a city level and then the city would have to appeal or somebody appeals, and that's a Supreme Court case on property rights, which is a constitutional thing. And who wants that in your budget? Not me. So the other thing that I wish to address is that it also um, abrogates and or ignores HOA regulations. And as a small municipality with 47 HOAs, that matters a lot to me. It also doesn't consider adequately special districts, which also function in some counties and developments, and Aurora has a bulk ton of them, that um, it, it basically abrogates that Title 32 governance entity. So it doesn't seem to me to be well thought out, as in contrary, it seems to be that it's really a, a lot of things said to get around a big problem to try to create something that you really want 
rather than working with municipalities to allow them to figure out how they can make this work in their town. So it's, it's engineering something that I think is too complicated. So I would ask for a friendly amendment to the motion to oppose. So you're asking for an amendment to take away the unless amended and just as oppose? Yes, that is correct. Sorry, I didn't articulate that well. Uh, Director Starker, you made the motion. Uh, uh, you accept that friendly amendment? Yeah, I would, I would accept that amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, did the second accept that? I forget you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Director Wheel, then uh, Director Baker, and then Director Starker. Thank and you. Then Holmes. Thank you. We in Cherry Hills Village actually allow ADUs. I was a little surprised to be in my representative who lives in Cherry Hills, that, uh, the state representative, that I'd have to get comfortable with the idea of ADUs, <clears throat> but we do allow them. And we allow them under our own terms. And I think that uh, they're well thought out. And I, I believe we are opposed just on principle that we're in a much better position to figure out what what an ADU ought to be in our village rather than being told by the state. As well, there's a whole bunch of unintended consequences that I think fall out of this that are, are just basically undesirable. So it's, uh, it's not a good thing from our perspective. Thank you, Director Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Arapahoe County discussed this in great detail. And um, we eventually voted to amend. Uh, there are two, maybe three areas that would apply in Arapahoe County to this. We wanted to stay at the table and be able to negotiate for better conditions. So um, if, depending on where the motion ended up as opposed I would have to oppose, I would have to vote against the oppose because we're at an amendment. Director Starker, then Director Holmes. Uh, thank you, Chair. What I, I, I'd like to have um, a little information from our, from our uh, legislative team about what the difference is between a strict oppose, uh, oppose on this or to oppose unless amended, and does that tie your hands when you get down to the to the uh, state house and talk and uh, speaking with the sponsors. Thank you. Um, so the difference essentially is that an oppose unless amended position essentially becomes an amend position. Um, legislators take those positions a little bit differently depending on the legislator, but usually you have a, a better shot at having a seat at the table with an amend position. Um, so Aurora is in a somewhat similar position to Arapahoe County. Um, we have some concerns related to home rule, um, but also uh, what the impacts would be on planned development um, that's already in the permitting process, and a concern about fee waivers because we use our fees to offset um, the impacts of our city process. So those are the issues that have come up for Aurora. And so if we take a flat opposed position, then I would have to vote no. If we take an amend, I can vote in support of an amend. Uh, the chair recognizes himself. Hi, Steve. <laughs> uh, uh, the, Edgewater is a small community. We are a dense community in our less than one square mile. Uh, we have density. Uh, but it's not the density that the state is telling us we need to have to cure all situations. Uh, I personally, speaking for myself, not speaking for my, my council, um, have questions about whether ADUs actually help affordability. I think this session they've used some, some great words to talk about generational wealth. I mean, they've, they've talked about some of those things, but it appears we're headed towards not allowing a community to require owner occupancy. Uh, not being able to have parking standards, which in a community that's one square mile is kind of challenging you know, with the, the business section running straight through our residential. 
Um, and we have, have gentrified like many of your neighborhoods have. We have some more naturally occurring affordable-ish housing that as, as things like this are mandated as a right by use, suddenly that property has a much higher price tag. And, and we are more likely to price people out of being able to live there instead of really helping with affordability. Uh, even though the state talks about certain grants and those type of things to help with, with ADUs being more affordable, the reality is it's going to be people that have that are going to be able to do this, and the have-nots are not going to be able to do this. And, and as such, I have, have challenges with it, and I also have the concern that local decision-making, and I use local decision-making as opposed to local control, uh, that local decision-making is, is important, and the, the actions that Denver has taken and other communities to have that public process, you know, in, in having some conversations, you know, uh, supporters of the bill are talking about, oh, yeah, there will still be some public involvement. Uh, I think this session, they've done a better job at making it seem kinder and gentler. But as, as I've listened to what they're talking about, about incentive, incentives, most of the incentives are do it our way or else. Uh, do it our way and we won't hit you. Uh, and that, to me, is not an incentive. That is a, a, a threat that I personally have some issues with. Director Ward. Uh, thank you, Chair. So for Broomfield, I think I'll have to take a uh, just a extension for the time being. We really have not considered this particular bill. Um, I will say, though, in the brief conversations we have had as a council and as uh, with staff members, Broomfield allows ADUs. We adopted that a couple of years back. Uh, we have not identified any major changes we would really have to make uh, for our own personal code as it relates to Bill. Um, I think in general, though, I do not support outright oppose positions. Simply takes you away from the table. Um, and our legislators are elected just like we are. They hear very similar concerns that we hear of housing affordability and perceived or correct, whatever the case is. Some local governments have not done the best at addressing that issue until it has reached crisis levels. And so the state legislature feels a need to step in and, and change something because they still they hear these concerns from, their own, from our residents that we're not doing enough. Right or wrong, that is the case. And I think to oppose it and take ourselves away from the table is not the appropriate approach. Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just want to talk about a couple of quick things. So, you know, post Marshall Fire, um, you know, everything that Director Conklin alluded to has actually happened within the town of Superior. We allow ADUs um, in parts of the town, what we call original town, and property values have gone through the roof. A lot values are now, you know, three times what they were before the fi before the fire. People are building ADUs because they need to to build you know, build their homes, um, but the prices for those ADUs are not. I mean, they're they're not affordable. They're three thousand dollars a month, right? So how does that fit in the landscape? Yeah, three twenty five to three thousand a month. Uh, for a five to eight hundred square foot place. However, we got to build our rules into you know what type of ADUs we want. We are a statutory town, so these kinds of bills scare the the bejesus out of us. We are going home rule um, in November. Uh, we've got a home rule commission or charter going on right now for exactly the defense that we need to prevent um, what the state is trying to do. Because what we're trying to do is everything that we can. Again, we're a very dense town, four square miles, slightly bigger than Edgewater, but 14,000 residents. So do the math on that. It's you know one of the more high dense communities along in the metro area. We have ADUs. Everybody who could build them is building them with an original town. What we also have is a very large plan community, where you know somebody who bought a house you know for 1.6 million dollars doesn't necessarily want an ADU going up next to them with the parking and everything else that goes with it. I'm not, we are, as a community, not opposed to ADUs. We want them where they make sense, but we want to be able to manage that process. So, I mean, to the, to the motion on the floor, I think, you know, I think that the direction is accurate. You know, I think we'd love to amend or watch exactly how it's, you know, I don't want to, you know, as a community, we don't want to turn it down because we think ADUs could work. However, we also would love to see some financial, uh, financial incentives to help us make ADUs work. When community members want to build ADUs, but we have no money to help them do that, it's sort of, well, I guess you could sell your lot to somebody else and they could build an ADU, and that's about the extent of what we're able to provide. Great, thank you. Dr. Shaw. 
Thank you. Sorry. I guess the, this bill allows $8 million, which isn't very much at 400000 a hit, right, um, for assistance building ADUs. The city of Lone Tree also allows ADUs in the right places. But what this does is it takes away your jurisdiction's ability to determine where and how far from the property line and whether there is parking or not in your neighborhood. So the vi I don't think that, to me, this defines a viable um, use of ADUs. It simply says they can go anywhere and you can't decide what's best for your community. And I think that's why I oppose it. I don't need to be at the table because if, if by amending, we are able to remove every preemption, this bill says nothing. Um, that, that's my thought. Thank you. Quick informational piece, just as you're thinking, oh my God, how long is this meeting gonna go tonight? Uh, I, I did wanna draw your attention to the fact that informational briefing number 14, we are going to table. So, so that you know, uh, don't be fearing that we have this other item coming up. We will we'll work through the legislative items. Director? Director. <laughs> uh, Director Starker, um, you made an original motion, you, accepted a friendly amendment to the motion. Uh, given the conversation that you've heard, are you still comfortable with the motion as you have it on the floor, or do you want to amend your motion? Well, and I'm not saying, I just want to give you the chance. You know, you, you, kind of, you kind of wound me up in some, you know, in some procedural matters here that I'm not an expert on, but I'll tell you, I was going to speak against the motion of oppose. I think I, I, think I agree with our, with our legislative professionals that, that uh, we're better to be at the table talking about this. As I understand, there was, some, there was supposed to be some money in here for some, some kind of, there was a carrot somewhere in the, in the mix, right? I thought so, but I'm not sure. There are, yes, there are two carrots actually. Um, one is the money that Director Shaw referenced about $8 million. That money will go to Chaffa. Chaffa will then create a few programs to help assist the, res the resident or the homeowner who is building the ADU, a loan loss reserve fund, a down payment assistance fund, those kind of things. But then the bill also does create a grant program that is supposed to go to local governments to help local governments absorb some of the, try to help local governments to incentivize them to reduce the costs for um, homeowners to build an ADU. There's no specifics in the bill on what that dollar amount would be and you know what local governments necessarily need to do to get those grant funds. When the governor submitted his budget in, um, no, on November 1, he did, I believe for this bill, had like 16 million reserved for the bill. And as Ed mentioned, it's a tough budget year, so we're not quite sure what that funding amount will eventually be, but it's silent on that in the bill. And I will say, so those are the two carrots, there's no stick in this bill. This is the one land use bill that has no stick. Did you say no stick? I, 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 I think that's up for discussion. But. <laughs> So uh, I've just been told that CML has an amend position on this bill, just so we all know where uh, one of our partner, you know, one of our other groups is. Yeah, and CCI hasn't taken a position yet. They will tomorrow, we think. CCAT is amend. Okay. So, Director Starker, um, what are the options? Can we go back to the well, or is that... So right, right now, you accepted the friendly amendment, if I understand correctly, to oppose. Right. Your original amendment was to oppose uh, unless amended. Oppose unless amended. And I'm just asking if, given the conversation, given the fact you were going to speak against your own motion, uh, do you want to withdraw that motion and, and, and put in? Uh, if that's still an option, I would withdraw the motion and make another, uh, back to the original motion of oppose unless amended, uh, striking out the um, the local preemptions. Does anybody want to challenge my ability to have him do that? Okay. So do we have a second on the new motion? Second. Okay. 
So we have an emotion. Uh, an emotion. A motion too. We have a motion on the floor. Any further discussion? Okay. Who would need to abstain from voting on that motion? Okay, I think we've got the count. Are, are you wanting to comment? Or okay, just for holding the hand up for that that action. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Seeing none. All in favor of the motion to oppose, unless amended, to remove the preemptions, signify by raising your hand. <laughs> okay, and any opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Moving ahead, uh, there are several construction defect uh, bills. Our, uh, our, our thought is to talk about those as a group and then try to make a decision in terms of where we stand with those. Director Starker. Did you have a result of the vote? Oh, going back to earlier? What we just finished. <clears throat> oh, yeah, it, it passed. Motion passed. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you were after the result that Steve Aricio won our. Uh, <laughs> Congratulations. On no, the only thing that I'm, you know, I, I would hope that we not make this, that we sort of stop talking about granny flats and start talking about grampy flats also in this uh, <laughs> in ADU conversation. Thank you. That's only totally fair. Thank you very much. <laughs> Moving ahead to talk about the construction defect uh, bills. Well, um, the, the last discussion was so much fun. Um, Do it again. <laughs> since I'm not the expert, but one of our lobbyists is the expert. <laughs> If uh, Jen wants to give a little bit of a preview and overview, and then you can have at it. Right, thank you, Rich. I will attempt <coughs> to be an expert. Um, so we have four, actually, construction defects bills, but one was introduced very late last week, um, so we won't be discussing that one. But um, of the three, the first one is House Bill 1083, and this is brought fairly early in session. It creates a study, essentially, to look at why there is no insurance market in the state for construction defects. Um, this bill has had its first hearing. It did come out of that hearing with a few amendments um, to kind of, um, I guess, to narrow the scope of the bill to have it just be a study. Um, the, the commissioner of insurance will study the insurance carriers in the state that offer, the, that offer construction defect insurance, uh, the rates, those kind of things. Um, that study is supposed to be done in one year. So that is the first bill. The second bill is Senate Bill 106. This is a bill that's being pitched as uh, the bill that might have legs, I suppose, if you will. This one has been stake held for months. Um, this is being brought forward by uh, some moderate Democrats in both the House and the Senate. Um, it essentially does two main things. Um, one, it creates a right to remedy or a right to repair. If a homeowner finds a defect, that homeowner can request that the developer or a third party make a repair. The second thing that that bill does is that it increases the threshold for the number of unit owners within a condominium complex to have a vote to engage in litigation before going to litigation. Um, this one is being supported by a broad coalition, the Homeowners Opportunity Alliance, or it's being brought forward by them. Um, you know, the main proponents of this bill, the home builders, the realtors, some business groups, um, those kind of associations and organizations. The opponents um, are mainly the trial bar, uh, the trial bar association and some individual um, attorney firms, as well as some advocacy organizations as well. Um, this one has its first hearing here in a couple of weeks. Um, as I mentioned, it, it does have some moderate sponsors on there and a good mix of Democrats and Republicans. It was assigned a tough committee hearing, so I know that a lot of conversations still need to happen on this bill in order for it to move forward. The third bill is Senate Bill 112. 
Um, this bill essentially does one of the main things that 106 does, which is increase the threshold of the unit owner. So it does increase that threshold to two thirds. Um, this bill is being, being brought forward by the Senate Minority Leader. Um, it's kind of being held out there just as a little, I don't know, a little treat on the side to see what happens with some of these other construction defects bills. Um, so it, it may or may not move forward in its current form with its current sponsorship. It's not going to go anywhere. But as I mentioned, if other things do happen with, with some of these other construction defects bills, perhaps something could happen with this one. So that's a fairly broad overview of those three that we have out there. Most folks are engaging on Senate Bill 106. Again, this is kind of seen as the compromise bill, um, if you will, um, that has been stakeholded pretty heavily. The governor's office is still taking a look at this bill as well, too, to see if they agree with some of the policy or not. Hey, thank you. Uh, discussion, uh, Director Kelsey. You said there was a fourth one that was just recently um, introduced. Do you have any information on that one? I do not. It is a I House apologize. Bill 1280, it is, if yeah. you want to look it up. I think uh, Parenti is the prime I, sponsor. Yeah, from what I've heard is that it spreads liability. Um, if there's any kind of construction defect claim, that it spreads liability to everyone. That's about all that I know. I'm, I'm sorry, 1230, 1230. Uh, Director Mulvey, then Levy, then Bear. I could get really granular on this because I do construction defect insurance litigation coverage. So all I'm going to say is the summary. The last one actually increases the cost of construction because it increases what happens in the lawsuit and takes away the ability to defend the lawsuit or to say so-and-so is responsible for the defect as opposed to so-and-so. And so the largest cost for construction is the $30 million for the townhomes when the attorney has knocked on every door to go find out, do you have um, fascia that's, that's bending? And so, and then inspect the whole home. It takes five to six years. That litigation is a lot of money. The ultimate result is that the insurance premium is hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the ultimate result of that is unaffordable housing because your builder doesn't have a risk. And so it doesn't really change the SIDARA law in the way it should. The one that is SB 106 actually does help to reduce the cost of building, but only to the extent of how the builder themselves would be hit. It says that all the things that the insurance company might not pay for, that you can't sue the builder for which basically means you can still sue the insurance company for everything. So it doesn't help that part of the problem. It kind of helps the problem in my mind. And so the first one, um, I'm sorry, it, it, it studies something that everybody knows the problem is there. And, that, and so my vote, if we were to have one, would be to oppose House Bill 1083 because it spends money on studying a problem we know exists. Or SB 106 would be to amend because it doesn't cure the whole problem. And SB 112 because it makes the problem worse is opposed. Thank you. Director Levy, then Director Baer. Thank you. Um, I'm a little handicapped because I'm about 15 feet away from my laptop, which was going to die. But um, I, um, so I have a very different um, um, position on on these bills. The one um, that directs the insurance commission to a commissioner to study the um, cost of 1083. You know, I, I don't. I, I think people think that construction defects law is driving insurance costs. And in fact, we do need this study to, to validate that that's the case. There are a lot of, um, there, there's a lot of claims in the whole area of construction defects litigation and housing affordability that have just become sort of the conventional wisdom just by being repeated enough times. And we don't in fact know that they're the case. 
Uh, we do know that insurance costs are high. We don't know what that's attributable to. And I, so I think we should support 1083 and actually try to get to the bottom of this so that we're all talking about the same thing. Um, I, I think we should oppose 106. It's being billed as creating a right to repair, and the right to repair already exists in law. Um, there's language in the bill that um, it's it's kind of – there's some internal conflicts in the language, and I, I don't really know what the bill sponsors are trying to do, but um, they allow the, the, um, the defendant to invoke the right to repair, which, if you read it through, then indicates that they control – what the repairs are, they control who the contractor is, and once they're done, the claimant, the homeowner, has no ability to say, you didn't fix the problem, you didn't do, you know, correct the underlying problem, maybe they did a superficial repair, but once that's done, then what the bill says is that they have no further right to sue over whatever the underlying defect was. They can only sue that the repair was not done appropriately. Um, so it, it's, um, I think it's really stripping homeowners of um, some very valuable rights that they need. And, and I really strenuously object to the characterization of people who oppose this bill as just being trial lawyers. Um, I spent seven years in the legislature uh, listening to people whose homes were badly, badly damaged. They were built on uh, dipping bedrock, expansive soils. Their homeowner's warranties had run out. They, the biggest investment they made in their lives was, was heaving and falling apart. And there, there are people who's, who have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to salvage something. So there are people behind these bills. It's not, it's not trial lawyers. They're helping these people. So I, 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 I think that really detracts from having a, a decent conversation. And, and I, I do think 106 tips the balance wrong. Um, the, the current law allows a develop a, a a contractor to offer to repair, um, to offer to settle before you can file the, the case in court. And that process can, can play out. Um, I don't know, you know, the, the bill, um, Senate Bill um, 112, yeah, I haven't had a chance to read that one. Uh, the bill that uh, Rep Parenti just dropped, um, is, um, I forget how that one was grossly mischaracterized, but uh, from what I've seen in the bill, it's, um, it's trying to prevent a, a common practice of um, having a, the, the homeowner's warranty or the contract to construct the, the uh, home contract the, uh, as in make smaller, um, the statute of limitations to bring a claim and so it says you cannot put that in a contract, and if you do put that in a contract, then that is an unfair trade practice. Uh, so it's, it's really just trying to protect the homeowner's ability to bring a claim within the period of time that the statute of limitation apply, um, already calls for. So I, I think it's a good bill. Um, Rep Parenti is bringing it because um, there are some homeowners in her district, I think many of whom are in Erie, who are dealing with exactly the kind of shoddy construction that leaves them, um, you know, with a with a, a a home badly damaged, big investment. So that would be my position on the bills. Thank you, Director Bauer. Bayer, I'm sorry. No worries. Um, thank you. Um, I agree with. I probably just say everything that Dr. Levy just said. Um, I. I think so our council discussed um, a number of these, and the town of Erie is a, um, a pose on Senate Bill 106 for many of the reasons that um, Director Levy just mentioned. Um, it's, it's industry heavy um, and removes the ability for homeowners to um, 
uh, make sure their home is repaired correctly. Um, and there were concerns around that. Um, Rep. Parenti's bill is House Bill 1230. It, it was um, written with our experience in Erie in mind. Um, a lot of homeowners in one, it's, it's neighborhoods, but one particular home builder, um, the bill tries to correct things like um, making it expressly illegal to say that your warranty is up after a year when state law says that it's longer than that um, and really supports homeowners um, and and I would I would also echo um, director levy's comments about um, homeowners being behind the bill and being, being the ones that oppose um, Senate bill 106 not just We've seen that in our community. So, hey, Director Martinez, then Director Stark, and then Director Coombs. You okay? Great. So those are our three on deck. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to um, add that you know I think Director Levy makes a lot of good points. I especially want to focus on the the value I see in that insurance study bill because um, you know to to put these other bills out there before having a definitive and set of data or um, you know deep dive into what what really is the cause of these insurance rates uh, seems you know it, it could be a bit unwise to do that so I really do think uh, that bill is very important and uh, reg regarding 106 I think there's some excellent points to be made and if to go down that path, we would want to make sure that taking such drastic measures actually does have an impact on the insurance rates, which you know supposedly has an impact on our ability to build condos. That's the whole point of what we're trying to do here: is get more uh, entry-level housing. And so, to have data or or real information that connects that would make it stronger. Now, all this being said. I'm not sure I can even vote on any of those because the city of Thornton, we've not had a discussion as a council about these bills, but I just wanted to comment and say that I think that there's some good points being made and that we should really uh, consider, um, you know, what the, we can get down to the reality of, of the cause and effect before we vote on whether we support on issues that could have uh, drastic uh, effects, you know? You know, a wise man recently told me that today's solutions can easily become tomorrow's problems, and so we don't <laughs> want to do that. Director <laughs> Starker, with uh, with re with all respect to uh, Director Levy's comments on that, and I I think you certainly have a have a point there, and we actually saw that in the early early 2000s when the Sadara legislation was passed that made it easier for the plaintiff's bar to aggregate cases. And I think we're not really talking about the real problem on this is not individual homeowners and the, and the homes that they own. What we're talking about is common interest communities. And, uh, and the reason that we don't have condo construction is because the, the plaintiff's bar, number one, takes these cases on a contingency. So they're going to get 30 or 40 percent of the proceeds of a multimillion dollar payout for their condominium association. Uh, a lot of times they take that money and they pay off the lawyers. They take a, a, a good portion of that money and put it back into their maintenance fund. And then they make a few repairs along the, along the properties, but they don't really go through and, and repair all the properties for the money that they've been, that they've been awarded at, uh, at trial. Um, I think on, uh, on, uh, HB 1083, you know, and I, I would go to our, our legislative uh, uh, experts on this, you know, that, that bill creates a study, but it also uh, creates a right of civil cause and action against the homeowners, or I mean against the, against the builders, and I think that's very problematic. I don't, I, I agree with uh, Director Mulvey that we, we really, uh, you know, I think we've got, had a lot of uh, information and a lot of uh, consideration about where the insurance is on, on uh, you know, particularly uh, common interest communities because it's very expensive and that's why that's why the only condos that are being built are in the multi-million dollar range. We're not building condos in the 250, 350 range uh, and I think that's a problem. I think I think SB 
uh, 106 is a really uh, sort of uh, the right the right to remedy is not is not the same as the right to repair that we have in statute now, and it and it needs the uh, uh, you know uh, Rep. Bird and Rep. Uh, Rep. Zinzinger spent a lot of time in in uh, in drafting this bill in a lot of stakeholder meetings, and I don't really have an opinion on this on uh, SB 112. I think that it's a little strange to me. Thank you. Thank you, Director Combs. So I'll refrain from commenting on 106 because I'm not in agreement with the Aurora City Council position. I will have to vote um, to support, although like I've lived in common interest communities where you couldn't get anything done because you can't get enough people because there are so many renters living there instead of owners living there. Um, that things can't get fixed. So that, that's just my personal experience with that, but I will have to vote in support per the city council position. That being said, um, you know, on 1083, um, <clears throat> I agree that we have to be making data-driven decisions, not narrative-driven decisions. And that's the problem with saying, oh, no, we already know the problem, because we don't. It's a narrative. We don't have the data to back it up. And so I think it's really important that we get the data um, in order to have those conversations in a more informed way. And I don't have a position on one. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mulvey, with a question. May I ask the, the lobbyists and and Mr. Morrow, is the the right of action has that been removed from ele from 1083, the study one? Yes, it has. Thank that you. part has been amended out of the bill. And then um, I'm reminded by our earlier conversation, and when you know you get steeped in what you know, but if the industry and the legislators and the rest of the world wants to see what I think exists, then 106 makes sense to me. If you need to know and you need the data, one year's a, a good amount of time to do that, and it does make sense because then you may see that data points in a particular direction. Okay, so we've had some good discussion. I don't know where we are on this. Uh, would entertain a motion on what action you would like to take, either grouping these together and taking the same action, you know, what, or dealing with them differently, or I'm open to a motion. Director Levy. Uh, I move that we, uh, that Dr. Cog support uh, House Bill 1083. And we have a second. Okay. Uh, so we'll take that individually, and then we can deal with, with where we are on the others. Um, any discussion on supporting of 1083? Seeing none, who would need, oh, Dr. Shaw. I guess my question was uh, for Director Starker. The bill creates a set of purchasers and residents. Can you speak into the mic, please? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the, so the question is about the civil cause of action. As I understand, that's been removed from the bill. Oh, all right. Correct. No question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, okay, who would need to? Uh, yes, sir. Director Odorizio. Yeah, so we, we're kind of monitoring both these in Adams County. We're probably abstained from all of it. We do recognize that uh, 1083 is, 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 while it is a study bill, some people are also interpreting it as like an off ramp to the other bill. And so it's kind of, all these are kind of taken in context with each other, unfortunately. Personally, like to look at things as a one-off, you know, as a single case-by-case -case basis. But the reality of the context that we're in now, we're going to be abstaining on this because we are recognizing that none of these are done in a vacuum. If you need to abstain on the vote on 1083 and supporting that, if you would uh, raise your hand. A lot of abstentions. Okay, 14 abstentions. Uh, if you are in favor of the motion, signify by raising your hand and keeping it up. Support. Motion to support. Supporting the support position. Okay, and those opposed. Four opposed. Five. Five opposed. 
the hands up again. Yeah. Okay, the, the motion passes. Okay. Um, any motion on 106 or 112? Uh, Director Mulvey. I'll move to monitor SB 106. A motion to monitor 106. Do we have a second? Second that. Director Mahold. Okay, thank you. Any uh, discussion on that motion to mo that was monitor, correct? Yes. Uh, Director Starker. I'm going to vote to oppose uh, this uh, this bill. I think, uh, I mean, oppose the motion. I think this bill's uh, had a lot of thought to it and really uh, moves the needle a little bit. Not not enough, not enough really to get condo construction going, but I think it moves in the right direction. So I'm going to vote no on the motion and urge you to do also. Comments. Okay, who needs to abstain on the motion to monitor 106? Monitor. Turn it back up again. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for sticking through this. Eight. Eight. All right, nine abstentions. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to monitor 106 signify by raising your hands. Uh, all of those opposed to the motion to monitor signify by raising your hand. Okay. That, 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 the, the motion to monitor does fail. Uh, do we have any other motions on 106 or 112? Uh, Director Starker. I would make a motion to support uh, SB 106. A motion and a second to support 106. Any further discussion? Director Levy, briefly, Ms. please. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't worry about that. No, I, if on that motion, um, I would have to abstain. So, I, yeah. I'll just change our count. Right. And, and we'll do what we've done on all these in terms of asking for the abstentions. Uh, with that, who would need to abstain? Signify by raising your hand and keeping it up. Collusion. Yeah. Collusion. 14 abstaining. Okay. Those who support the motion to support 106, signify by raising your hand. Okay. And those, finally, those that oppose uh, the motion to support 106. And that motion passes. So we, we have agreed to support one of six. Director Whitlow. I have a question on these um, last three bills. Um, could you give us kind of like a time frame of how they're moving through? Sure, absolutely. So uh, 1083 um, is going to be in Appropriations Committee for a while. It's got about $500,000 fiscal note attached to it. So it'll be in Appropriations until the long bill passes, the state budget, excuse me which usually happens in late March. So I imagine that one will receive action maybe early April. Um, 106 is up for its first committee hearing in two weeks. And then 112, excuse me, I don't think will be calendared in the near future. Yep. Yep. Dr. Starker. I would make a motion to monitor 112. Uh, uh, motion from Director Starker, second from Director Shaw. Any further conversation on monitoring 112? Who would need to abstain from the motion to monitor 112? Those in favor of the motion to monitor 112?
And there was a paper. I'm opposed, right? I still need to get the opposed, or did I already do that? Okay, those opposed. And what is my name again? Okay. Thank you very much. And so that one, that, that one that? passes. Okay. I just did, and nobody raised their hand. So, okay. Oh. Well, we'll do it again. Where Those opposing that motion. I, I think what you've said. I still believe in taking the vote in all three. So, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, is that it? That's all I have. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> you all did amazing work on that. Thank you very much. A little bit more, and, and we'll get, get you out of here as soon as we can. Uh, as mentioned, we are tabling the quarter planning pilot program update. Uh, informational item, I'll call to your attention to the package just for, for your uh, reading pleasure, the administrative modifications to the 2024-2027 transportation improvement program. Uh, I have been told that we need to have a motion to accept the result of the balloting that appoints Steve Odoricio to the stack. Motion to approve. Second. Steve Odoricio as the member and Greg Mills as the alternate. Do I have such a motion? Thank you. And a second. All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. Aye. And any abstention. Okay. We'll move ahead to committee reports. Uh, we'll start with the report from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Nicholas Williams, your final hurrah. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can you come back as an alternate? Yeah, true. Uh, <laughs> Stack did meet in February. Uh, uh, no major action items, but a few important updates. Uh, began to, uh, the Transportation Commission will begin discussing the program distribution for formula funds in March. If you remember, that was one we got a number of updates throughout last year, very critical uh, source of funding for the region. Uh, also received a overview of the uh, update to the state freight and passenger rail plan. Uh, main difference between 2018 is current plan advancing passenger rail as one of its goals. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, preview of the next statewide plan. This will be the 2050 statewide plan due in August 2025. Work has been done uh, uh, on that. And the update 10-year uh, plan will be updated once the current portion expires at the end of fiscal year 2026. And finally, you, of course, just wanted to, to say a thank you to the board for letting me represent the region on stack. And certainly a thank you to Ron for all the technical and emotional support through these meetings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Next up, report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Uh, Mayor Bud Starker, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Chair. The uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus met in full caucus on February 7th. We had a, uh, uh, a presentation by Kevin Bomber and uh, uh, Heather Stauffer with the Colorado Municipal League talking about land use, zoning, and uh, granny flats, or grampy flats, if you will. And uh, we had discussion on uh, potential construction litigation reform. Uh, Mayor Castriota gave us a, uh, she is on the property tax committee for the state and gave us an update on their uh, work th throughout the state. Uh, Mayor Malay uh, gave us an update on uh, Proposition 123. She is uh, a member of the Middle Income Housing Authority and how they were uh, looking at that. We had a brief, uh, a brief briefing from uh, RTD. Uh, we had uh, Maria DeCambria with the Department of Local Affairs give us an informative update on what DOLA is uh, up to these days. And Ray Gonzalez with the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation uh, gave us a rundown on their activities. And with that, I will conclude my report. Thank you very much. Report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, Jayla Sanchez Warren. I want to say to the new members, I'm Jayla Sanchez Warren, I'm Director of the ACC on Aging. Uh, we have monthly meetings with the Advisory Committee on Aging. Rich gave an update on legislative issues, um, bills impacting older adults. We have a public awareness campaign going on right now. How many of you see the Facebook, uh, connect with Dr. Cog's Facebook page? If you haven't, have you seen the older adult um, stories? So take a look at that, hit like. So then more people will see them, right? Why do we need a public awareness campaign? Because a lot of people don't know what the Area Agency on Aging does. They don't know that the older population is one of the fastest growing, the fastest growing population in the state. And they don't understand the importance of the Area Agency on Aging 
um, services, what transportation means to older adults, what nutrition means, what in-home services mean. And, you know, we have this Senate Bill 40 going on, uh, and we're trying to educate people to help them understand why that $5 million, not a lot, guys, for 16 AAAs, um, is so important. We also talked about... So um, the Home Delivered Meal Program in Adams County, you may have heard, um, the, the, we, we found out shortly before Christmas that uh, the, the, the provider there wasn't going to be able to deliver home delivered meals to 550 people at the end of December. And I'll tell you what, we um, worked closely with uh, the commissioners in Adams County, with the city manager in Adams County, with Adams County staff, uh, volunteers of America stepped up, and we were able to serve every single individual on January 2nd uh, with meals. I, uh, we, Dr. Cog funds the rural piece of that, the Eastern Plains, so Watkins to Deer Trail. Uh, we had Volunteers of America preparing the meals, but after the volunteers that were doing it decided not to do it, we couldn't find volunteers to deliver those meals. So for a month, Dr. Cog staff, the AAA staff, delivered meals, including me. And it's really good to go out and see. We are charged with serving those most in need. And I can tell you we are absolutely serving those most in need. I got, I got to hear comments about the food. Uh, Commissioner Odebrecio, I can tell you that they like the food and they like the choices, so that's good. Um, and they also... Um, said things like, thank you for valuing me. Thank you for remembering me. Uh, these folks could not go out and get food on their own. They couldn't afford the groceries or they can't drive. Um, they have to have home delivered meals. So I want to let you know that I know we're serving the exact population and they're very grateful. That's my report. Thank you very much. Uh, we Uh, there is no report from the Regional Air Quality Council, except a report from E-470, Director Mulvey. Uh, we did not meet this month, so there's no report. Awesome report. Uh, report, from the, <laughs> <laughs> report from the Colorado Department of Transportation, Jarius uh, Pakbaz. I'll make this uh, quick, Mr. Chair. I just want to mention that the Colorado Travel Count Survey is out. This is uh, taking a sample of 20,000 residents and looking at their travel patterns to help forecast future travel in the state to help with uh, looking at long-range transportation plans, not only statewide, but also with our MPO partners, including Dr. Cog. Happy to answer any questions about it, or if you'd like to know more, uh, feel free to uh, uh, contact Dr. Cog's staff and we can have a discussion about it. But other than that, that is the end of my report tonight, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Report from the Regional Transportation District, Brian Welch. Mr. How much Welch. time do I have here? Ten minutes. No. I'll do just two things out of ten. Uh, the downtown Boulder Station lobby has finally reopened after it's been remediated. Yay. And uh, uh, Denver Mayor Mike Johnston nominated Jamie Lewis to fill out the remaining term of Kate Williams, who unfortunately had to uh, leave the RTD board. Uh, Director Flynn, did, has the council taken action yet on that recommendation, that no, nomination? No, it'll, it'll come through, sir. Okay. That's my report for tonight. Great, brief report. Thank you. A uh, couple of things, and I've got a couple of comments, and we'll get you out of here in just a, a few moments. Uh, our next meeting is the uh, special meeting that we'll do on March 6th, and then the board meeting on March 20th, where you will have an able new chair and Director Shaw. I wish you the best. This is one of the, the best experiences I've ever had. You'll have fun. I appreciate that, that stalling technique. That's good. Thank you. That helps. Uh, Richard Kondo, welcome. Uh, so excited to have you join the executive committee. Uh, I will be on the executive committee one year, four years, the immediate past chair, and you are going to bring much to the group and, and leadership with Dr. Cox. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I mentioned uh, the, the awesome work that Jeff and Colleen have done in sharing the committees and, and moving through the process uh, and just are also a joy to work with. And uh, it's, it's a, a wonderful executive committee that I think helps uh, guide this organization. Kevin Flynn. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for being a role model to me in terms of being the, the chair before me. Uh, thank you for your role as immediate past chair on the executive committee. Thank you for all you do and will continue to do as a representative here and, and your voice, which is incredibly valued and uh, very much appreciate you uh, and, and thank you for your work. And when's your movie come out? Hi. He's, he's got a movie. There's a movie of, of work that he's done. <laughs> but if you know who Mark Maron is, Mark Maron's in the movie. Who else is in the Jude Law's in the movie? Oh. Yeah. So, so, so pretty incredible. Uh, I, I, Doug was like, what, you don't enjoy sitting next to me? Um, Doug is a phenomenal executive director for this organization. Um, I regret that your next birthday will probably not fall on a board meeting night, so there will probably not be a singing telegram, so that, that's not going to happen. But uh, no, I, I just the, and Doug, Doug's right, the amount of contact we had through this year has, has just been great, and you've, you've been incredibly supportive, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, as I said, staff, you rock. Uh, I was just an amazing staff at this organization. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to this group. All of you come here um, and, and give it your all. Uh, and your service to community, whatever your motivations are to step up and do that, you are to be respected, admired. I have enjoyed serving in this role with you as the board. I'm looking forward to sitting you know, there and, and moving around and being in different spots during different meetings, getting to sit next to, to Mayor Starker and Director Kelsey, who I've spent a lot of time sitting next to before assuming this position. Um, when I took this position a year ago, I shared with you that I had lost a friend days before and that that shaped a lot of where I was at. Uh, somebody who relied on mass transit, somebody who uh, had had a lot of issues and somebody who had worked filming city council meetings back in California back in the day and was the person I would call after meetings go, you'll never guess what happened tonight. Uh, somebody that would have been thrilled that I was elected mayor Somebody that would have been thrilled about hearing stories about this. But I think about Leo, my friend, uh, and really dedicated this year to him. I think I did okay. Thank you.